I'm trying to text right now. <laughs> but give me one minute. Sorry about that. There you go. Connecting to audio. Connecting. To Aha, there you go. Perfect. So now, Dennis, if you can unmute. There you go. Okay. All right. Yes, now we are good to go. Okay, here we go. Uh, call to order the uh, <clears throat> Malibu Planning Commission regular meeting of May 17th. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate this Zoom meeting process. Planning commissioners and city staff are participating from remote locations. All votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. You will only be able to speak during the meeting if you follow the instructions on the screen under the quote, sign up to speak, close quote tab. Once the item is called, no further speaker signups will be allowed. So please make sure you visit malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to download the Zoom application and sign up to speak. The recording secretary will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called. So you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. I know there are process is something less than perfect, but I think there are some numbers there at that uh, at that screen. If you're yep. having difficulty getting in, um, try to call the numbers and, and we'll try to make I every effort to, um, to uh, get you on board. Um, okay, that said, um, can I have a, a roll call please, Kathleen? And you hear me, Kathleen? Kathleen, you're muted. Ruh -ruh. She's unmuted now. Kathleen, can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, fine. Kathleen, can you hear me? Hello, Kathleen. Come in. Alex, how are we doing? You got? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Give me one second. I, I've got to call her. We oh, okay. seem to be having some technical difficulties tonight. Yep. Maybe we can get back into the building on June 14th. Maybe. The LA City Council is. We can't let them go ahead of us. They already did it. Not in the building. Oh yeah, they're having open meetings. All right, let's give her a minute. She should be uh, exiting and coming back in. Chair Jennings, if you like, I can call roll, uh, do my okay. best with that, and we could at least get that moving. That would be a great idea. Go ahead, Richard. <laughs> All right, I'll do my best. Uh, Commissioner Hill? I'm here. Commissioner Maza? Here. Commissioner Smith? Here. 
Commissioner Weil? Here. Chair Jennings? Here. And we have a quorum. Great. Um, I need a motion I'll go on to approve the agenda. Oh, John, wait, do you question, do uh, is Kathleen our secretary? I she is. Okay, I'm here. here. Apologies, I had some technical difficulties that have since been resolved. So okay, okay, I'm going to try to do uh, make a motion to approve staff's recommendation with the following items being continued. Um, item three B four to a date uncertain. Item three B six to a date uncertain. Correct, Richard. Uh, actually, if we could, we could just continue that to the next meeting. Uh, we'll we'll bring back a cur uh, amended report as well as an amended site plan. Okay, that's to six seven twenty one. Um, item four A to a date uncertain. Item four B to a date uncertain. Item four C to a date uncertain. Item four D to a date uncertain. Um, item five C to June seventh, twenty twenty one. Item 5E to a date uncertain. And item 5G, Richard, to a date uncertain. Uh, if we could continue 5G to the next meeting, please. To 6721. Yes. Okay. Now I want to point out to the public that item 5G is the tow yard. If you're here for that, you will not be heard. Right. Um, so 3B4, is that correct? 3B4, 3B6. Now the staff recommendation was receive and file. Is there some explanation for that, Richard? On 3B4, uh, the reason why we asked for the continuance on that is that we wanted to update the site plan as well as provide some additional information in the uh, staff report, or excuse me, in the um, ACDP report, so that the commission understood the setbacks from ESHA and a bit further clarification on the functions of the new uh, the new tanks. Uh, okay, so it's a staff rec it's a staff recommendation. Yes. Right. Okay, that's the motion. Um, is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, call the roll, please, Kathleen. Commissioner Maza. Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Hill? Yes, and I see a hand up, Jeff. A hand up from whom? Uh, uh, Joseph. Oh, you mean, <clears throat> oh, yeah, no. just, just for reference. Okay, um, let's just call the roll, though. Sorry. Um, Vice Chair Weil? Yes. Chair Jennings? Yes. Motion carried. Okay, Joseph, is that Joseph Lazuma? Or is, has his hand up? I believe so. Well, he's got an item on here, at least Burgess. Uh, Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. um, yes, Joseph, this is on item 3B6, is this? Correct, I just wanna make sure that staff and I are on the same page. I didn't, uh, didn't expect 3B6 to be uh, continued and especially continued to a date uncertain. Um, I th thought we put it on to the next meeting. That is, um, that was the, uh, the motion the way I wrote it down. Is that correct that, or not? That's, that's how I had it as well. Okay. So uh, it's, 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 uh, it's a staff recommendation and it's continued to the next meeting, Joseph, which is June, what, June 7th? June 7th. Uh, would there be any opportunity to keep it on the agenda tonight as discussed with staff earlier today? Um, so the, so the yeah, staff, you know, Richard, you want to try and straighten this out because this is all conversations that have gone on between you guys. I have no idea what you're talking about. Richard? Certainly. On 3B6, there was a email that was circulated to the commissioners and I'll, I'll let Pat, because better at the legal jargon than I, uh, discuss that one. And the concern for it is that the continuance would allow staff to 
address the, the comments that were raised um, in that email, uh, but primarily, as Pat will probably be able to go into, there is a concern that, um, I'm gonna mess this up, there's a 72 hour notice issue. <laughs> and, uh, Pat, if you could- Correct, yeah. Or two, uh, we wanna make certain that it's been fully vetted and all the parties, we know that there were three parties that submitted correspondence in favor of this project. Uh, we just want to make sure that there is full disclosures and transparency on this. Pat? Correct, yes. And so the that, that, that notice requirement is is not only for the benefit of, of course, the applicant as well as the, you know, the the parties who have commented, but you know, at least from our perspective, more importantly, the public writ large. So we want to be able to have that 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 correspondence properly out in the open in the public. That way it can be fully vetted and addressed by any member of the public, any party, et cetera. That's why the continuance was, you know, was was the staff recommendation. What what correspondence was submitted before 72 hours? Who's that? And so, yeah. And so and so my understanding is that there was a correspondence circulated amongst the commissioners on on Sunday. I thought that that the applicant was was provided that. If not, that's even more of a reason to 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 continue this item, um, and 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 that way, you know, once again, echoing Richard's sentiment to make sure that everything is out in the open, everything is out in the public, and and the applicant, interested parties, and the and the public writ large can 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 address it and and you know comment on it one way or the other. I mean, we're right. ready to go tonight as, as the applicant. I mean, regardless of it being distributed less than 72 hours or last night, we're, we're ready to stay on the agenda. Well, we understand, Joseph. I don't think that the only way to do that would be if there was a motion to amend the, the approval of the agenda. I don't see any hands up indicating any commissioners are willing to do that. So um, I guess the answer is no. Um, just my property owner is asking if we're being heard as an ACDP at the next meeting. It'll be. I assume it's going to be coming back in the same status it was, it was on for this agenda. It's just, just a question of noticing and, and uh, relaying information. It will be coming on back the same way. Yes, that's correct. It'll stay as an administrative coastal development permit. Okay. All right. All right. Sorry about that. But uh, let's move on to um, the written and oral communications from the public. Oh, wait a minute. Don't I have to get a... Um, report on the posting of the agenda. Yes, sir. Um, the agenda for this meeting was properly posted on May 7th, 2021 with the amended agenda posted on May 12th, 2021. Okay, written and oral, there were item, uh, item, what is it? Item uh, B2, written and oral communications from the public. Do we have any communications from the public, Kathleen? We do not. All right, that takes us to planning commission and staff comments and inquiries. I see any hands going up for commission comments. Yeah, John. Okay, I'm unmuted, yes. Um, first I want to add, uh, get an answer on what's happening with Nobu and Soho. Um, the question would be, will it be figured out by summer? And if it isn't, will the seven year violation be uh, be put in force. And then the second question while I'm at it is any movement on opening us up to regular meetings since many cities have done it, including Los Angeles. I'm sorry, I missed the last part of the first question. Uh, will we receive the Nobu Soho item before and, and finish it before summer and if not uh will the seven year violation on the proper property be enforced before summer starts so the the answer if you'll hear it before summer is at this time no because we are still waiting on caltrans to approve the changes to the intersection however uh, what I will be doing, and I've already spoken to our code enforcement officer about this, is that we want to sit down with them because uh, I observed it myself and took pictures of it the other day uh, as I was driving uh, eastbound on PCH and there were cars blocking the 
the right now and I was actually in the left of the, of the number I was in the number one lane uh, but the point being is there were cars making lefts in there and they were blocking traffic so our code enforcement staff we're going to talk to both Nobu and Soho and see if there isn't you know some changes or something we can do to try to facilitate something to work this summer I will also see if we can get some sheriff involvement that seemed to be very helpful um, with a, a previous lieutenant. She was out there and, and had staff. So it's not dead in the water. Um, I will explore to see if there's anything we can do. In terms of in-person meetings, I will pose the question again uh, at our department head meeting tomorrow to see if there are any updates. Um, at this time, I have not been given any uh, dates of when we can expect to be holding meetings in person. Thank you. Uh, who's next? Who would like to go next? Yes, uh, David. Yeah, I just want to mention the issue that has come up uh, uh, about the removal of the fence at the end of La Costa Beach. Um, this is, a, without getting into the history of how it got there in the first place and how it got removed, the fact of the matter is that at the moment, there is uh, nothing between PCH and the beach except the rocks that are there and the public. It's a beach that the public has tried to gain access to for a long time. And it is at the moment an extremely dangerous and uh, unregulated situation with no parking, no, no bathroom facilities, no trash facilities, no ability to get across the road there. Um, I understand there are discussions that are occurring between uh, the city of Malibu and uh, uh, MRCA, which at the moment I believe is the party that is uh, supervising the beach, but it's, uh, I just want to mention that it's, it, it, it's a real hazard uh, with the rocks that are there uh, and the fact that uh, there's no regulation day or night. If it is to be converted to a public access way uh, with a normal entrance through a a gated uh, uh, sort of door uh, and uh, hours hours that the public can be there and should be there. Uh, that should happen as quickly as humanly possible because right now it is a horrendous accident waiting to happen. Um, and there is a community meeting on this for those of us who uh, live in this area or are otherwise concerned about it on uh, Wednesday night um, at uh, one of the residents nearby residents' home. So. If people are concerned about this, please know that uh, it's it's in the process of being addressed, I hope. Okay. Uh, Dennis, you had your hand up, I thought. Yeah, um, it, it, driving by the cost and, and without that fence there, it just seems naked. I, I haven't been here as long as everybody I'm looking at, but um, uh, it, it definitely feels different when you drive by there, there's no doubt. Um, you know, uh, Rick Wallace wrote an article for, on his real estate deal in the Malibu Times, and he talked, he's a fire victim, and he talked about how it's been a real struggle for him. It's obviously a lot of people here, and um, I know that our people are doing the best they can. The people I'm looking at on our screen and uh, other staff, it's, it hasn't been easy. The fire was bad enough, obviously, but then the pandemic and trying to get things done, and he I think he just got a final or he's getting ready to move in. So there's, you know, there's a lot of things I, I, I've thought about. I, I know better than go too far with stuff here because I, I am the newbie at, at, you know, like 11 years and eight months. But, um, you know, I, I don't know things that help inside the office. I don't know if that's something Yolanda can use instead of having California code check that we bring people in-house. I've worked in municipalities where they used to use Will Dan as we did and they brought stuff in and it seemed to work a lot better you've got control over the people that are that are around you um you know i i don't know just stuff like that I, is it is it time for us as a city to have more say about our environment and everything that goes on around us um so i i you know i was just thinking about that i, I had talked to uh, chair frost this weekend that which was really a, a treat i have to tell you and um we talked about stuff like that and just how hard it's been in the past to like the police department and what it takes to do that. And we heard from those guys last week when they talked about how much it costs to do that. So, 
you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just thinking about those things. And um, uh, also, I, I heard from uh, Mr. Fernandez about, you know, I asked about the, the case project, the old Carmer property and getting the, the walls done. And, and I guess that, that situation has been approved the way it is. So, but maybe in the future, we can talk about some kind of a standard that we would have so we don't look at concrete and uh, the blending thing, which was, you know, my thing that I had to do at Tuna Canyon. And um, so maybe that's something we, we can talk about or maybe staff can take a look at and for future reference, we, we blend a little better with our environment. And then um, I had the pleasure of driving on the new, um, what I will affectionately call from this point forward, the Steve Uring Highway between uh, Webb and uh, Malibu Canyon Road. And uh, boy, what a nice job Public Works did there. And uh, hats off to all those guys. It, it, it's great. It's a good drive. So um, way to go. Thank you. Uh, Craig. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo you on the concrete and on the Las Flores thing. Um, yeah, I, I was at the MRCA hearing about that a year or two ago and Bonnie Blue was there and we each independently pointed out that there wasn't enough shoulder to park there and they seem to acknowledge that but then nothing's happened and this is a lot like the thing that's happening down below me that little uh, we call it figment cove um, ironically um, but one difference is we've always had a fence up the whole time and the notion that they've taken the fence down there in the interim is scary so yeah I, I echo your comments David um, sitting down at this end of town near the Topanga fire, I'm looking forward to the Chinook helicopters coming in a couple of months. They carry much more water and they work at night and this fire would have been done by now if uh, they were here. Um, staff, on story poles, it might be a good practice to take shots just as a matter of habit from the public street in addition to the cardinal uh, orientations. Um, so that we would have those in the record if it might be relevant to something like ridge lines or neighborhood character or whatever to actually see the shot from the street. Um, more sort of philosophically, I've noticed that we've had a couple things lately that have in the code have language about how it is deemed approved if we don't act. That's in the telecom law and in the ADU law, one from the feds and one from the state. So this is sort of an open question for constitutional scholars. Is, is this just a coincidence or a trend? Should we expecting ev even more of our lives to be ruled from on high with these deemed approved things where the municipality doesn't have much say in the end? Um, I'll just mention we're hearing the ADU ordinance on Thursday. Personally, I feel like that is would be a great candidate to have at our first public meeting because there should be a lot of interaction involved in it. Um, and I feel like there are a few things in the staff report I'd like to hear more about, like the state law that informs it and the affordable housing element and how it interacts with that. I feel a little bit at sea with the information we have so far. So um, we can, I'm hoping that on Thursday we might talk about, uh, we might get into it and talk about continuing it. I don't know. That's, I, I just feel like it's, it's one of the biggest things to affect Malibu if we want to increase housing density that much. And I think more people should be involved. There should be publicity in the paper that we're having hearings about it. And um, I think I think it would be a matter of greater public interest than it seems based on the lack of any communication so far. Um, Save LA Cougars just got a $25 million challenge grant, like a matching grant from the Annenberg Foundation to do the uh, o wildlife overpass out on the 101. And, uh, I think it's still gonna be a tough target to hit that financially. They, they still need it above and beyond that $35 million, but um, I, it's gone from the realm of almost impossible to merely difficult. Um, two questions, of, or I guess now just one question of staff. Um, on the policy interpretations manual, I'm wondering if there's some way to review the source of its authority or give us a little report on it. Um, it's not really clear what if any of those were voted on by council or how they came into being. I understand that those policies are to address so-called gray areas in the law, um, but when it comes down to it, and if you need to be relying on one of those policies, it's, it's not clear to me what the basic authority underlying that is. That, that would be helpful to um, 
understand that better. Uh, I think that's my comments. Yes, thank you. Okay, um, Beth? Yes, John. I just wanna make one last comment. On Thursday, the co last Thursday, the Coastal Commission heard the rodenticide ordinance is proposed, well, not as proposed by the city, but as worked out by the city and Poison Free Malibu and, and the attorneys for Poison Free Malibu. And we got a unanimous vote. Richard worked very hard on getting the language exactly right, along with our attorneys. And it will come back to the city council for approval. It's a huge victory. And for the first time I've seen five different coastal commissioners thanked Malibu for the work they did, which is kind of unique for us. Uh, and it was, a, it was a unanimous vote. So thank you, Richard. Okay, on the subject of, um, of uh, Kocek, um, just anecdotally, my personal experience is that uh, there has been an increase in in-house capability, and uh, at least I've been told that uh, my rebuild project is being, uh, co being uh, checked in-house, so there's that. Um, as far as the policy manual is concerned, um, uh, I can add a little his history to this. The policy manual is basic, was originally started basically as a way to ensure that um, similar uh, situations were treated similarly. Um, there, none of those policies were voted on uh, by the city council. Uh, they are simply policies of staff. And uh, which is the reason why I've always argued in certain contexts that we're not bound by them either. They're simply staff's policy. This is the way staff is going to do things. And so you're not bound by them. We're not bound by them. Nobody's bound by them, except that's staff to the extent that they want to have things run consistently. Um, and that's, those are my comments. Um, Richard, your uh, staff comments. Thank you very much. Um, just wanted to respond to Commissioner Weil. <clears throat> wanted to let uh, the commission know that actually this afternoon I reached out to MRCA to try to have a discussion with them. We'll see if that's received well. Uh, hopefully I do hear back from them, uh, but staff is following up on that. Um, <clears throat> and also uh, just to let everyone know in case they were wondering, um, at, I did confirm and at this time there are no pending projects in the city that would affect access or anything like that along that stretch of beach. Um, there, many years ago, there was a project discussed, uh, but nothing has been submitted to the city. And yes, we can perhaps come back uh, with a, a deeper explanation about the interpretations manual. Uh, but as the chair mentioned, uh, that manual has grown over the years as a way to ensure that staff treats everybody fairly and equitably. And usually it's based off of lessons learned or comment uh, from Zoe races or the planning commission or city council. For example, I know there was one I wrote in there for the La Costa overlay district uh, when there was a question on how to interpret the um, 40 foot projection, I think it is not 50 feet, I think 40, 40 foot projection. And uh, basically what we, in that case, what we were doing was memorializing uh, the action that was taken by the, 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 the planning commission so that in the future we applied that fairly and, and also in a way consistent with how it was explained that um, the creators of the overlay district what they envisioned there. So we can do a, a little bit more in depth, but uh, just at a high level, that is what we do. And um, yes, as mentioned by the commissioners this evening, on Thursday, we have a special meeting at 6.30 uh, for the ADU ordinance. Uh, and the purpose of that meeting is to make sure that before we go to the city council, uh, the commission has had a chance to look at the latest updates uh, from the state law. And those state law updates are incorporated and then your recommendations, of course, would then go on to uh, the city council. But um, if the appetite of the commission is to continue with that, that is within the commission. Um, we've re received some requests that we move on this. Uh, if I have any other questions, be glad to answer them. And that concludes my report. Okay, thank you. Uh, that takes us to the consent calendar. Um, we have 
several items on the 3B section. Who wants to, um, are there any items that the commissioners wish to pull? I wish to pull 3B5. 3B5, all right, John, and um, anybody else? Okay, hearing none, can I get a motion on 3B123? One, two, three. One, two, three. And six, no, three, yeah. I make, I make such a motion. All right, I'll second it. Kathleen, will you call the roll, please? <laughs> yes. Um, and I did check. Nobody from the public wished to pull anything. Thank you. Commissioner Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Vice Chair Weil? Yes. Chair Jennings? Yes. Motion carries. All right, that takes us to 3B5. John, do you just need a question? You want a full staff report? What do you want? Uh, I don't need a staff report unless you do. I just want to uh, make some comments and a uh, motion. Uh, I sent this email in late this afternoon, but I don't think it got distributed to you. I asked Renika some questions on this project, and I'm going to have to read you the answers. First one was how an ACB could be issued on February 11, 2008, and after uh, 13 years still be in effect. And the answer was the ACP received four time extensions with the last one expiring February 11, 2015, seven years ago. Um, I realized the gap left in the list. Of, well, that doesn't matter. That's the important thing. Okay, the second question was, uh, if for any reason was it vested, was the work continued, continually reviewed every six months as the planning uh, permit department requires uh, continuous work for 13 years? Uh, the answer is, uh, the planning determined that the final grading and foundation only permit constituted substantial work for the rest of the development approved on AP07. Although the building permits had to be reissued for the house to be built. Okay, uh, but that doesn't really answer the question because you have to continually work on an ACDP or a CDP or as it expires. Um, then the, the third question was, uh, as an accessory structure is not allowed as a standalone ACPP, why is this project an ACDP? The answer is the accessory structure is not a standalone use. The primary residence recently completed construction on the property prior to working on the landscape installation before building permits can be signed off. Uh, that clause, the ACDP, is not a coastal commission appeal jurisdiction because the art studio uh, costs less than $100,000 to build. My comment on that, and, and I would like to get a comment from uh, Dennis since he's a contractor, I have never even conceived of building a structure in Malibu for 140 something dollars a square foot, including foundation, roof, electrical, plumbing, et cetera. Um, I do not believe it's possible. I called Tough Shed, their largest shed is available at approximately 60 bucks a foot with no foundation single wall construction, no insulation, and no windows and, no door, and one door. Um, the last question was, uh, page two of 17, figure one, does not appear to match the plan on the same page. Uh, has the project been modified by the planning approval? If so, when? Uh, the ACP originally approved a rectangular shaped residence. This is the answer. Substantial conformance was approved showing a U-shaped residence while maintaining the building footprint, which was used in the site plan. The property owner roofed the U-shaped portion during construction. Staff will have to will have the property owner provide an as-built for the main house before the art studio goes into plan check. So it was never checked to be finished. 
Um, number five, the, uh, oh, that's just an appealable question. It's an error in the staff report. So we have a structure whose permit expired uh, on the main ACDP issued 13 years ago. Uh, unless Richard can show, I talk, oh, by the way, I have to disclose, I talked to Richard today and Renika about this. Um, as far as I'm concerned, this cannot be accepted as a, a project that expired seven years ago. Uh, we, every permit in Malibu can be continued forever. Share containers for 16 years before we put the five-year limit on extension. Uh, this, this is not waived by the $100,000 limit because it is impossible it is impossible to build a house for $130 a foot. Anybody who's built one in the last 10 years knows that. Uh, and there was not a continuous process. So the permits, in fact, did expire, were never extended after the four extensions. So this, this project has to be pulled as non-compliant as far as being uh, under a permit. So it cannot be an amendment to an ACDP when the ACP does not exist. And okay, that's, Rich, that's an important be, be, thing. Be, before we get, uh, we've already gotten too far into the weeds here. Let's get a staff report on this. Um, of course, yes. Good evening, Chair Jennings and members of the Planning Commission. Um, this project is a request to amend Coastal Permit 07-00, excuse me, 070, which was approved in 2008. Um, to allow for a one-story new single-family residence and associated development. On May 11th of this year, the planning director approved the subject amendment to allow for a new 670-square-foot um, detached accessory structure. Um, and as Chair Mazza mentioned, there have been some concerns um, expressed regarding this amendment to the CDP. Um, the first of which is the validity of the initial underlying CDP. Um, as you mentioned, um, the property had final grading and foundation only um, permits. So the grading was done, the foundation was completed, and the planning de department determined at that time that that work co constituted substantial work under the previously approved CDP. Um, to allow for the rest of the development um, to proceed. And I do, um, I do realize that I, I misspoke. Um, the building permits were never issued for the primary residence. Um, the property owner, um, while he was working on the grading and the foundation, there were some challenges in meeting the fire department's requirements for fire flow for the main house. So it looks like, and looking at the record, the city allowed the grading and foundation to be poured while the property owner worked with the fire department to address their um, the fire code requirements. Um, those requirements were met in September of 20, 2019, and the building permit for the primary residence was issued um, the very next month in October. And after checking with building safety staff, um, the property has had consistent inspections to keep those um, building permits active. Um, I don't know if there's anything else I need to address in this um, brief presentation, uh, but that does conclude my presentation and I am available for any questions. And also if I could jump in, the, the, the owner builder is also available for questions. Um, he is prepared to answer questions about the inspection records and also about the cost of the building. Uh, staff <coughs> did confirm with him uh, the cost of construction, and, and so he would be able to uh, explain that if needed. Well, let me get let me get a little uh, a little advice here. Um, an administrative coastal development permit that comes forward, the the, the commission has the right to uh, to ask that it be brought back as a full coastal development permit. Um, does the same rule apply to an amendment to an ACDP? We're not we're not reviewing the ACDP itself. We're reviewing this uh, this 670 square foot amendment to uh, the ACDP. So, what are the rules, or what are, what's our jurisdiction with regard to 
to whether we're going to have an amendment brought back what as a full CDP? That doesn't make much sense to me. Uh, Richard, Patrick, any help? Yeah, the if the commission wishes to pool this, um, it would basically mean that the amendment would become a public hearing. Okay. Question of Patrick. Um, this CD, this ACDP expired. It expired in 2015. No, no permits were issued for four years after that. So you have an expired, you have an expired ACP. It no longer exists. And if, if you remember City Hall, by the way, right behind City Hall, there's a structure with steel beams sticking up in the air and a poured cement foundation. It's 23 years old. It expired. John, you have a question or you wanted to continue to My make My question an is if an expired ACDP, can you amend something that has been expired? It has expired. It, it's a, just to once again, I understand your question, but from my, what I heard from Ms. Brooks is that the, that the ACDP is in this event is not expired, or at least that's, no, that, well, that's, that's, that's very, very much not yeah. true. And so, and, and so, but, but, but to answer your, I guess, can, can, in, in hypoth could a expired permit be amended? I mean, I guess esoterically, potentially, yeah. I mean, you could, you could kind of attempt to, but once again, that's, that's not the case here. We would, you could, I guess, kind of attempt to bring it back forward and, and, and amend it, sure. Um, but once again, that's, that's not my understanding of, of, of the facts here based off of staff's presentation. Well, that's not what staff said. Staff said between the expiration in 2015, nothing was done until 2019. Okay. During that period of time, it expired. It was expired on September <coughs> 11th, 2015. Why, why do you think Caraza, the grading permits and the foundation only permits were issued in 20, I think they were finaled in 2014 and 2015. Right, but they had no other permits, correct? That is correct. Okay. And, and so, John, it, I think the best way to proceed with this is if you have a motion uh, that you want this matter brought back as a, for a public hearing, uh, you should make that motion. And we can debate that. The, I make the motion that the uh, art studio be brought back as a public hearing. The amendment. No, I don't believe there is an amendment because there is no ACP. Ah, okay, all right. I, I get your point. All right. Is there a second to that motion? Uh, I'd second for uh, for discussion. Okay, uh, let's have that discussion. First of all, uh, I, I think you're confused, John. The, the coastal development permits can vest, and we've had debates about this over the years. The city is very, very reluctant to say that anything has ever vested. Uh, for good reason, but in fact, uh, that's the way the Coastal Act is set out. And for, as a matter of fact, the, the, the Coastal Commission itself is, is much more generous in allowing vesting really than the city has been. So I'm not sure I understand your argument as to why you think this Coastal Development Permit expired. Because it's the same thing as the building right above City Hall. They put in the foundation and then they stopped and didn't do anything again. And the city has stated that property has expired. And the reason it's expired is because the policy of continued development. You can't walk away from a, a house. Now, granted in 2014, you had a permit for the foundation. You got approval. After that, nothing, zero was done for four years. The, the permit department requires you do something every six months to keep yeah, but if I heard that right, Commissioner Maza, they, they were having a problem with the fire department and they had to go back in to be checked on. So you can't do anything as long as those guys are looking at it. You don't have a permit. The, 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 that's like saying the house up above City Hall is fine because they got the foundation in, they did it with a permit, it's still good. We do not let CDPs or ACDPs go on forever. That's a fact, isn't it, Richard? We, unless there was significant work done, as the, the chair pointed out, 
Uh, staff does not like to use the word vesting. Pat will tell you it's a, a term we, we, we cringe when we hear it. Uh, the code uses the word commenced, and it's my understanding, and Renika can clarify for me, that this work commenced under the original ACDP, uh, thereby making it valid as long as building permits remained valid. And our, we researched this with the building and safety staff today, and building the building and safety staff did confirm for us, correct, Renika, that the permits have remained active on site. So he had commenced work and maintained active building permits. Well, Richard, how could that be if there are no permits were issued or existed between 2014 and 2019? You can't work on a permit when you don't have it. And Renika stated that the permit department said no permits were issued until 2019. Okay, that's not continuous work. Okay, so is there any, yes, Craig, you have <coughs> uh, weigh in? Your yeah, this, I, I had a question that might get us past this. Um, first of all, I have a couple, probably minor substantive questions, but uh, the, the question in front of me at the moment is on um, that qualification to make it an administrative permit, and they're hanging it on the $100,000 uh, and I know John had a question outstanding for Dennis that Dennis didn't get to answer yet. Uh, but, but and, and I'd like to hear that, but let me just say the language in 13.13.1 refers to other developments not in excess of $100,000. There's no verb in that sentence. It doesn't say costing less than or valued uh, at. And so I don't know. I don't know that we can just infer that we're talking about merely material and labor costs of what does it cost to build it if if you're talking about the value of something just sort of generically this is is it a hundred thousand dollars or more then to me it i would start you're adding about a sixth of the square footage to a property that's worth something probably several million dollars if not more given the land it's three acres um, so if the whole property were worth only a million and a half dollars, this one sixth would be adding $250,000 in value. I mean, that's one way of measuring it. So I don't know. My question would just be, what does that hundred thousand dollars mean if there's no verb in that sentence? Yeah. My answer would be that 13.13.1 has a lot of exceptions that allow administrative permits to move forward. Improvements to any existing structure, that's allowed to be go forward by an administrative permit. Any single family dwelling, that's allowed to go forward by any, uh, uh, by an administrative permit. Um, driveways, access road improvements required by the fire department. There's lots of things that are allowed to go forward by administrative permits, including projects, any, any kind of a project that's a development not in excess of $100,000. So, I'm not sure that 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 whether that the meaning of of uh, what that hundred thousand dollar means, whether it includes the land and all the rest, as you're implying, uh, that that seems to me irrelevant. It's it the 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 obvious intent here is any minor adjustment uh, to to uh, either existing or proposed structures. There really uh, is, is not, none of but, those none of those are included. None of those qualify. I had a conversation with staff and we, we ruled out the other ones and we're hanging it on the 100,000. So that's why I focused on what does that really mean? Uh, Dennis, do you have a comment on the, on the valuation? You know, the guy, the guy could have secured all of his material a long time ago, not now. It might be he and a labor and they build it themselves. I don't know. I just, he's an owner builder. He may have done a lot of that work on that house himself. It's a stunning piece of property. And you can't say one way or the other. If he does all the work himself and he's able to do those, he probably might be able to pull that off even here. You know, you, he already has the property, so you don't have to worry about those costs. You've got, you know, the concrete, whatever it is. At the time, he probably said you could do it. Uh, we know that lumber, everything's gone up, but he may have secured prices or he may have materials already in the yard that he can get that's paid for. So I, I can't say that one way or the other on that. I'm sure he would tell us if we wanted to, but... I don't know how the hell you, you can't really question a guy about that. 
if that were the interpretation that it's the building and labor costs, and whatever, then you'd want some sort of documentation, I suppose. Um, I had two other sort of minor substantive things, and I don't know if, if they get no, addressed no, now no, unless we open the whole no, let's not. We only get to the substantive things if we're going to bring it back for a public hearing. Yeah. So we've heard the motion. Uh, let's. Um, it's been moved and it's been seconded. Let's take a vote on it. Commissioner Maza? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Commissioner Smith? No. Vice Chair Weil? No. Chair Jennings? No. Okay, I that's so, just so you know. That vote says every single CDP John, and ACP John, John. that is issued is good forever once you pour concrete. Good John. forever. Crazy. I'm sorry. Look, let's go on to the next item. That, that takes us from uh, item 3B5 to. But don't we have item, to receive, receive and file this one? It is a receive and file. It's, it's, okay, it's, good. It's received and filed. Um, that takes us to item 5A. Yeah. 5A. Horizon. Staff report, please. Yes. Hi. Uh, good evening, Chair Jennings, members of the Planning Commission. Uh, next item tonight is a proposal for a new wireless communications facility in the public right-of-way to be utilized by Verizon Wireless. The project requires a coastal development permit number 18-032, a variance number 18-039, and a site plan review number 18-034. Next slide, please. The wireless facility is being proposed on the land side of Pacific Coast Highway on the sidewalk within the public right-of-way. It is approximately 300 feet northwest of Carbon Beach and about a half mile east of Malibu Pier. The site is directly in front of a commercially zoned parcel currently being used as office space. Here you see the project location indicated by the red star and all the properties within a 500 foot radius indicated by the red circle. Next slide, please. Here is a longer map that shows the area of PCH that the site will service. As seen here, this stretch of PCH has many commercially zoned properties to the east and west. There are also residentially zoned parcels to the south and the east along Carbon Beach. Next slide, please. The project proposes the following. It's a replacement streetlight pole and a new wireless communications facility that reaches an overall height of 32 feet, three inches, including an omnidirectional canister antenna on top of the pole one remote radio unit concealed in a shroud attached to the side of the pole and a battery backup unit that is ground mounted that will be conditioned, that is conditioned to be visually screened from view. The project proposes the installation of three handhold boxes inside the right of way, one for Verizon's fiber optic lines, one as a power disconnect switch and one for electrical power. There are also two discretionary requests proposed Variance number 18039 for a uh, replacement streetlight pole over 28 feet in height and a site plan review 18-034 for the installation and operation of a wireless facility in the public right of way. Next slide, please. Verizon Wireless is aiming to improve their cellular coverage and capacity to the general area surrounding Carbon Beach. Here's a coverage map provided by Verizon showing the current area as having poor and fairer coverage according to their coverage interpretation. Next slide, please. The proposed wireless facility will help fill a gap in Verizon's cellular coverage and capacity within this targeted area. Coverage that was fair and poor will increase to good according to Verizon's coverage interpretation. Next slide, please. The applicant indicated three alternative sites that would help achieve Horizon's coverage objective within the area. Visual impacts would be similar for all the proposed alternatives, none of which would block blue water views of the Pacific Ocean. Each pole replacement would require a variance for a taller pole, and all three alternatives were proposed on the ocean side of PCH, which were closer to residentially zoned parcels. Pursuant to LIP Chapter 3.16.11, the preferred location for wireless facilities is on property designated as non-residential. Because the alternatives were adjacent to residential parcels, those locations were considered by staff as inferior. 
uh, to the proposed location, which is adjacent to a non-residential parcel. Next slide, please. Here's the site plan showing the proposed replacement pole with the attached wireless equipment, the ground mounted backup battery unit and the three handhold boxes within the sidewalk. The project requires a site plan review for placement within the right of way. Next slide, please. Here is an elevation showing the existing and proposed streetlight pole with the associated, wi associated wireless equipment. The current pole is 30 feet, four inches tall. The new pole will be 32 feet, three inches tall. The new pole requires a variance because it hosts a wireless facility and it will be taller than the existing pole. Staff was willing to support the variance because there are no proposed visual impacts and the design will main maintain a streetlight height consistent with other streetlights along this part of PCH. According to Verizon, SoCal Edison was not willing to accept the design that allowed them to maintain the existing height of the pole. Next slide, please. Here's a photo simulation of what the wireless facility and the replacement pole would look like in real life. The design chosen was the elephant ear or Mickey Mouse design. Next slide, please. Um, Oops, I added one more slide and I must have added it too late. But um, what I will say, I'm sorry, Alex, you can go back to the summary page. Um, last meeting's planning commission directed staff to research the feasibility uh, for wireless carriers to obtain the general liability insurance insurance required by ordinance 477U uh, adopted by the city council in December of last year. Uh, after a discussion with the local insurance agent, staff was informed that this type of insurance is a standard type of commercial insurance and the amount in which the city is requiring is not egregious. Uh, it's more than usual, but not egregious. So with that, staff proposes an amendment to resolution 2140 to add the following condition. Uh, the permittee shall obtain and maintain throughout the term of the permit commercial general liability insurance with a limit of $5 million per occurrence for bodily injury and property damage and $6 million general aggregate, including premises, operations, contractual liability, personal injury, and products completed operations. The relevant policy shall name the city, its elected appointed officials, commission members, officers, representatives, agents, and employees as additional insureds. Permittee shall use its best effort to provide 30 days prior notice to the city of to the cancellation or material modification of any applicable insurance policy. So with that, staff uh, recommends adoption of resolution 2140, approving the project as amended. I and the applicant team are available for any questions. Thank you, Tyler. Um, disclosures? Um, who would like to go, Craig? Disclosures. Um, I I had a few emails. I think that maybe not everyone got between from Nicole and Lonnie, but nothing that I don't I don't think we just talked about anything that isn't in the record already. John. None. Dennis. None. David. None. Me none. Uh, questions of staff, or can we open the public hearing? Question. John. Uh, this insurance, um, was it specified that this was for uh, a radio frequency uh, health um, insurance or was it just bodily injury? In this, in this ordinance, the, the public right-of-way ordinance, it's just general liability for bodily injury and the other things I mentioned. There is in the non-right-of-way ordinance that was adopted, uh, a clause that says they cannot exclude pollution insurance, which would, or pollution coverage, which would include effects of radio frequency emissions. And uh, I seem to have gotten a, a, a summary of what we can't consider under federal law. And it said we can't consider health of radio frequency. How does that tie into this? You're talking about the, um, the the memo that came out from Verizon's yeah. uh, people? Yeah. Our, I'm sorry, Commissioner Mazza, can you repeat the question? Well, Verizon sent out a memo that said, here's what you can't consider. One of them was health issues from radio frequency. Number one, I guess, is that true? And number two, 
are we doing that by requiring this insurance? We didn't invite our uh, technical uh, consultant tonight. I didn't think it was necessary, but uh, what I can say is this project was vetted for radio frequency emissions and it, it does meet FCC standards. So we do on every project uh, require that they submit a radio frequency electromagnetic radiation report that shows us the proposed emissions. And from that, we decide whether or not they meet FCC requirements. And that is, uh, constructed by a third party that they uh, then uh, give to us in their application materials. I don't know, I think that John's question was more to the, que to the point of whether by, by requiring insurance as you have proposed in, as an amendment, we are uh, in fact uh, doing a prohibited act by considering health issues. That's correct. Well, we're, we're allowed to consider safety issues and that would cover uh, some of that insurance would go would speak to safety issues. Sure, the I'm truth. About the but I'm, I'm just trying to explain what John's question was. And John's question had to do with whether we are engaging in something which is prohibited by federal law by requiring this insurance. No, not not this insurance particularly, the fact that it requires health insurance or whatever the term was that you, you read off. Bodily injury, right? Bodily injury, yeah. Uh, and, and once again, Tyler, if you want to you know, interrupt me, go ahead. Th th this type of insurance requirement, you know, that's been vetted by our, you know, by the, the consultant and some of our wireless ex experts in, uh, in our office. Um, and, you know, that, that, and once again, I, I, I haven't seen the, the memo from Verizon, but that, that kind of prohibition is this idea of we're going to deny or we're going to cite it somewhere different because we as the city think the radio frequency is 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 damaging to you know someone's health therefore denial or you have to move it this is a bit different this type of insurance requirement to say hey should you have should you cause problems you know it's it's it is to answer your question frankly we do not think it is it, it is prohibited and the city can do it okay, okay. Good. can i open the public hearing or other questions craig yeah for staff this is for mainly for tyler and i guess maybe richard um can you clarify what conditions could be applied, what, what features of the more recent ordinance could still be applied as conditions on this? I know, for example, there was some discussion about, um, and maybe we did this on the last one, uh, yeah. the application um, filing requirements of the, the more, the heightened engineering uh, application requirements. And um, I know we just talked about the insurance and the pollution insurance. It seemed to me that there were maybe a few other things that are from the, the newer ordinance that we could nonetheless, if we wanted, uh, say, yeah, we could apply this as a condition. Well, so the way we've reviewed these projects is they were, they were deemed complete before um, the new ordinance was adopted. And so we are using the design guidelines from the old ordinance. However, we are using the conditions of approval from the new ordinance. So in the new ordinance, what we did is just basically copy and paste what was in, what was approved in December. There's not specifics that says like it needs to be undergrounding or whatnot. Those are design guidelines. Uh, we kind of do those by case by case basis if, if necessary. So what I can say is for example, on applications that weren't deemed complete, and I can't say for certain, but there might be an opportunity there to uh, require, at least in a condition of approval, to underground uh, excess equipment. Okay, thank you. All right, let's open the public hearing. Uh, Kathleen, who have we got? We have the applicant team of Bardo Osorio, Daisy Yu Kimpang, and Verna Allen Allenday, is available for questions. And then we have Lonnie Gordon, a member of the public. Okay, fine. Let's uh, let's start with the applicant team. Uh, whoever is supposed to be taking the lead on the thing. It's Bardo Osorio. Hi, good evening, uh, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. You've got 15 minutes for your applicant team. You can save some or all of it if you wish for rebuttal. Uh, but uh, you can divide that up any way you want, but it's 15 minutes for your entire applicant team. So when you're ready, go ahead. Oh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, my name is Bardo Sorio, and I, uh, I work for Yukon Group, who is a wireless consulting company. 
uh, hired by Verizon Wireless to assist with the uh, with the engineering and uh, permitting process for this site. Um, if we can go to page three of the uh, presentation, please. So as, uh, as Tyler mentioned in the staff report, um, we are replacing an existing uh, SE street light. And that uh, street light is already uh, in excess of the uh, threshold for overall height that the city will allow for wireless uh, facilities. And um, we can't replace that street light with a shorter street light because uh, unfortunately SCE does not uh, provide a, a large inventory of replacement pole options uh, to choose from. Um, however, uh, we are proposing to give you the, the least intrusive design that we could uh, given uh, that SE does have very strict uh, design parameters in terms of what type of equipment we're allowed to uh, place on the pole and the manner we're allowed to place it. If we can go to page four. So as, as part of an SE requirement, uh, the antenna does need to be placed at the top of the pole above the luminaire. And for this particular side, because of so the type of radio that is being proposed, we're not able to place it um, within the radome uh, above the luminaire. So instead, it does need to be placed below the luminaire within a shroud. Um, and additionally, we, we designed this facility to use a WTR technology to place uh, associated meters uh, below grade in, uh, in the right of way. Um, as discussed earlier, uh, we uh, well, we haven't discussed that yet, but um, we are going to be uh, placing um, a battery backup unit at grade um, as a means to provide reliable communication um, during times of, of emergency. Um, and although the, the BBU is being placed on the sidewalk, it was designed and placed to comply with, uh, with ADA standards in the right of way. And we can go to page uh, six to the uh, ASA. Thank you. So um, aside from choosing the uh, proposed location, we did survey the immediate area for other possible candidates. And um, we did present three different alternatives to the to city staff. Um, if we can take a look at alternative one, uh, the next page. So the first alternative is uh, located approximately 165 feet southeast of the proposed site on the south side of PCH. Um, and this site presented a variety of issues due to existing substructure near the existing uh, site pole, uh, along with uh, two existing driveways on each side. Um, one of the requirements from SCE when proposing a small cell facility on, on the streetlights is that we must relocate the streetlight uh, between three to four feet in either direction from the existing pole. Uh, so as you can see in the image, both driveways um, and the existing handholds in the area um, do not provide enough room for us to meet that requirement. Uh, next page. So the second alternative is uh, located 85 feet south of the proposed site, um, also on the, the south side of PCH. And um, this site also presented um, an array of challenges when having to meet SCE's requirement of having to replace a street light. Uh, three feet from the existing. As you can see, uh, this is pretty much the same scenario as alternative one, where you have um, existing driveways on both sides and uh, several handholds um, uh, from sub substructure that prevent us from meeting um, that requirement. Uh, next slide. And um, for the third alternative, um, uh, at the risk of sounding repetitive, as you can see from the image, uh, we encountered the same issues as one and two, where you know we just don't have uh, sufficient room to relocate the street light. Um, and on top of that, the need to place the the battery backup unit uh, at grade in the right of way, there just there, there wasn't sufficient room. Um, so for now, I'll conclude my part of the presentation, and I'll let Daisy address the uh, other talking points that are of interest to our party. All right, thank you. Commission. Good evening, commissioners. I'd like to do a time check really quick. Just want to make sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. 10 minutes and 16 seconds is remaining. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kathleen. Okay, next page, please. So thank you for the opportunity to speak 
to you today regarding this project. So we are proposing the placement of this new cell site to provide capacity solution by adding new services, as well as increasing antenna signal coverage in the general area on Pacific Coast Highway. As Bardo mentioned, this will be a replacement Southern California Edison streetlight. Um, according to Caltrans 2018 average daily traffic, there are approximately about 41,000 average daily trips um, on PCH at this location. So this count includes vehicles um, going northbound um, between Caltrans post mile 44-121 near Las Flores and post mile 47.091 near Cross Creek Road. Next slide, please. As mentioned also earlier, just wanted to give you a visual of what the site height is. Currently, the pole already exceeds the height of the requirement of the area by about four inches. And with the luminaire, it has actually um, exceeds it by 10 feet and, um, no, sorry, by two feet and four inches. And um, Verizon is merely um, proposing a design that SEE um, has allowed and is the closest in height to the existing um, area, um, area heights for the poles in the area. Now, granting a variance here does not constitute a special privilege to the applicants because of the existing pole being already at 28 feet, exceeding 28 feet. Next slide, please. So one of the um, letters that we had received and it was also been discussed here is regarding um, the, app the applicability of the new code requirements um, to this particular location. Um, so Verizon contends, and this was um, communicated with staff previously in a letter from our council a while back, actually directly to planning staff, that under state law, the new wireless facility um, regulations and related application requirements can only apply prospectively and not retroactively, especially to applications that, um, that have already been deemed complete or actually has been received before the, re the revision is effective. Um, similarly, a federal law also uh, prohibits the same thing, mainly because due to shot clock time frames that do not allow new issues and delays to uh, come from re uh, retroactive application of new city regulations. Um, next slide, please. Verizon also would like to contend that um, similarly, um, while we've been repeatedly asked to provide coverage maps and we do provide it to a certain degree, we do have a right um, as far as federal and state law to be in the public right of way under California Public Utilities Code 7901, which grants us the right um, to install equipment in the public right of way without a need to prove um, the need for the facility. And similarly, the FCC in 2018 has basically disfavored uh, materially, um, uh, basically asking for coverage maps and such data. Verizon has provided here today, and we'll discuss a little bit of it, just to provide context and clarity for why we're asking for this location. Next slide, please. So as mentioned earlier by Tyler and also shown, here's uh, uh, where our coverage uh, currently lies without this location. So as you can see, we have four poor coverage in Lavender in the area. It's between two of our locations, two of our microcells, um, A3 and A2. So that particular stretch um, suffers, um, you know, as far as for our users when there is especially a lot of traffic in the area. Next slide, please. So with the proposed location in Malibu 2, we will be able to um, basically bridge the gap between those two locations. Uh, provide pretty much good coverage and capacity for the need when the need arises and also introduce new service to the area that wasn't there before. And um, according to the FCC, that is the need, the test, one of the tests that we are allowed to do is basically show that we're densifying our network by either um, adding a new service or increasing um, service quality. And that's what we're doing here. Next, please. So uh, based on the last um, planning commission meeting that we had, um, we have a few items that we would like to raise as objections to the draft conditions of approval. One of them is obviously being that we just got wind of the new addition of the insurance requirements. We found out about that uh, right before the meeting. So we would like to have the opportunity to um, review that and address it. Um, and then of course, uh, condition number one, um, add a reasonableness standard. Um, to that condition for indemnity. And before I proceed, actually, Kathleen, can I do a quick time check again? You have five minutes and 30 seconds. 
Okay, perfect. Condition number 30, um, we're requesting that if uh, the city does want us to move or relocate the facility for any reason, that we have some notice to at least move the site, not less than 12 months. Um, we're also requesting on condition 36 to remove subpart B regarding undergrounding because undergrounding is not involved in this particular plan that we have submitted, nor um, was it part of what the design was. Um, on condition 43A, um, the, this area of the right-of-way is governed by Caltrans and not City Public Works, so we're asking that the condition be revised to reflect this fact. And finally, condition number 53, we would, um, we're again requesting that this statement be removed because instead of automatically expiring the permit for the facility, um, we should be given the opportunity um, to be able to um, address any conditions that need correction. So um, having presented all of this, we are here and available for any questions um, from staff and or the commissioners. And thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Okay, thank you, Daisy. How much time does, do they have left, Kathleen? Four minutes and 21 seconds remaining. Okay, Lonnie Gordon. Can you unmute? Hold on just one second here, if you don't mind. I have to exit my full screen. You, okay, thank you. How many minutes do I have? Three minutes. Three minutes, everybody else gets a lot more. Okay, yeah. well, <laughs> good evening. Applicants get 15, everybody else gets three. How about the non-applicants? Um, all right, don't, don't count those minutes, please. Um, good evening, commissioners. Um, you changed a little bit on me with the insurance issue. So I'm going to read what I have prepared and then we can go from there. <clears throat> so now you can start the clock. This proposed project is very similar to the one from the last meeting. It's close to the beach. It's within 100 feet of residences and seeks a waiver. Staff is handling this application the same way as the last one in terms of not applying the recently adopted ordinance 477. Our position is still that there are portions of Ordinance 477, which is the one passed the urgency ordinance in December 2020, that can and should be applied to this application. Scott McCullough, our attorney, has advised us, has advised us that the FCC's small cell order only binds us to the old ordinance with regard to aesthetic standards and requirements. For FCC purposes, spacing requirements are part of aesthetics. The FCC and the Ninth Circuit decisions are very clear on this point, and the citations are listed in the letter that I sent you. But the FCC did not prohibit cities from applying other requirements in Ordinance 477 to deemed complete applications. For example, nothing in the small cell order stands in the way of imposing the ordinance re insurance requirements. In this regard, we notice that staff's proposed conditions in the permit do not have, as you said, any insurance obligations whatsoever. There's an indemnity clause, but no insurance clause, but I guess that's changed. The Planning Commission should require the insurance coverage and additional insured requirements in Resolution 2065, Section 10.A.24. Moreover, if you apply the old ordinance to this application, the staff report is deficient. Verizon is seeking a waiver and staff report page number 10 notes that Verizon has the duty to prove that there's a clear need for the facility and no technical feasibility alternate alternative exists. The staff report makes a no technically feasible alternative finding, but makes no finding regarding the predicate and prerequisite clear need for the facility. The City Council passed Ordinance 477 to address the rush of wireless carriers and their relentless deployment applications. They made clear it was to be applied to pending applications. With their approach to these applications, City staff and wireless carriers are disregarding the City Council's intent and thwarting months of work by citizens of Malibu by continuing to apply the very rules our City Council deemed insufficient and then acted on an urgency basis to change. We ask that you not disregard what council put in place. Please apply the current rules to this and any upcoming applications and make effective and protections for our city council, make the effective protections that our city council worked so hard to put in place in Malibu. Clarity is needed on which ordinance and resolution is used for requirements and limitations. 
Has a clear need been demonstrated? Both the LIP and the old ordinance require a demonstration of clear need. And finally, insurance should be required, adequate insurance, not just indemnity. And thank you for listening. Hey, thank you. Um, back to Daisy or whoever wants to speak for the team. Uh, you've got four minutes and 21 seconds left. Uh, just before you do that, um, Kathleen, there were no other speakers uh, from the public, right? That is correct, yes. No okay, way. so back to the team from Verizon, four minutes and 21 seconds. Okay, thank you, commissioners. Um, just wanted to just reiterate based on uh, what Ms. Gordon has stated, um, the, the law is pretty clear, state and federal law, as to how um, requirements and or standards are to be applied. Our application in front of you today has been complete and been with city staff since early to sometime 2020. Um, so to retroactively apply um, any part of your new code is actually um, not consistent with state and federal law. And we've stated that multiple times to staff. This is not a new argument that we've raised. Um, in addition to that, um, we've provided the coverage maps that have been asked for. Um, we provided additional explanations to that today. I'm happy to answer any further questions as to that. Um, I think everyone here has driven up and down PCH and at some point, depending on which carrier you have, may have experienced um, you know, challenges with connectivity. And we are here to provide Malibu the support that it needs, especially during times when there's a lot of people using the service, um, either in an emergency situation or in a situation where you just have a lot of tourists that are enjoying your city. So what we're asking for here today is for um, state and federal law to be followed. We are defined, we meet the findings of your code. Um, and um, we thank you for the opportunity to speak in front of you again today. Okay, thank you. You have two minutes and 55 seconds left, but I take it you're done, right? Okay. Yes, sir, but I'm available for any questions. Yes. Right, of course. All right, that, that concludes the public hearing. and we'll close the public hearing at this point and come back to the commission table for discussion, possibly a motion. Um, yes, Craig. Yeah, the, right off the top, I should have asked this of staff at the beginning, but there, there's no radius map in the uh, staff report. And um, I'm, I find it uh, concerning that we have not heard from any owners of businesses nearby or residents. There's the enclave building, zero neighbor comments. And there are a number of Sweetwater residents that are right in the uh, uh, good zone, the hot zone of the signal there. So um, I, don't, I don't know, I'm, I'm mentioning this first because I just wonder if that is some sort of uh, procedural defect in, in how this has come to us, whether that should needs to be done before we even go any further. Got a question? That was a question, I guess, for for uh, maybe for Richard, um, in terms of you know what, what's required of the hearing. If we don't have a radius map, do we know that even notice was uh, sent out to people and of what distance? Richard. Yes, that is correct. That in the agenda report, we did not include the radius map. It was inadvertently left off. However, we did uh, include a proof of the you know a copy of the notice that we did send. Um, and the code does not specifically state, uh, to my knowledge, that a radius map is one of the required documents of an agenda report. Uh, staff had been including that uh, because of commissioner comments in the past. Uh, Pat, would you like to add to that? No, I'm. I my understanding is the same as yours right now. As I feverishly bring, try to uh, take a look at it. Okay, thank you. I. I have a number of questions for staff and I have some concerns about the variance findings too. I don't know, Jeff, if you have a, an order of procedure you want a, a way to organize all this, should I just go through uh, all my stuff or? Well, let me, John had his hand up. Let me go to John and then uh, we'll go around the table and come back to you and we can take it issue by issue as you identify them, uh, okay. John. Well, I was gonna make a motion. Uh, make a motion. Question purses, purposes. Uh, could I get the uh, Daisy's list of the conditions she wanted to change put up on the on the uh, screen? Is that possible? 
because last time we went through it and there were a bunch of them that she was correct that were while you're trying to john while you're trying to do that there was one that she mentioned particularly which was a uh, condition 43 uh which he said it's a caltrans uh, issue not a public right. works issue and i wanted to get staff's reaction to that sounds like a reasonable suggestion to me if, if, it, if in fact we have no jurisdiction mm -hmm. Uh, Tyler or or, um, um, or Richard? Based off of looking at the plans, it appears that yes, this is all within the public right of way of the state. Uh, Tyler, am I correct on that? Oh, Tyler, you're muted. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, I was just checking uh, uh, condition 43 to see if it was specific to a city requirement. Um, it doesn't look like it is. It probably pertains to the correct uh, right of way agency, which in this case would be Caltrans. So we could we could change that. Okay. Um, my motion would be to approve staff recommendation with the addition of the insurance. <clears throat> Uh, and if we could put up her her uh, changes she asked for, I got some of them down right. I think last time we you, we added the word reasonable to number one, uh, which I think we all should be reasonable. Uh, number forty three should be changed to Caltrans. Well, uh, right. It does. It, it, it excuse me, John. Uh, forty three does refer. Uh, that uh, you can't begin to work until it, you demonstrate to the city public works department that the project complies with all generally applicable laws. So there is a specific reference to the city uh, public works department there. Um, so I, yeah, I think it should. I, 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 and I'm sorry, uh, Chair Jennings, but at the end, I believe com, uh, condition 55, we specifically say the project includes improvements within the, the Cal, California Department of Transportation public right of way and therefore a Caltrans encroachment permit is involved. That's the one we did change. That one can be interchanged if it's within city uh, streets. But I, like you said, Chair Jennings, was just a little hesitant because I wasn't sure, or we weren't sure as a staff if that was, you know, something the city wanted to review. Um, well, do we have jurisdiction to, uh, to, make a determination as to whether the project complies with all generally applicable laws, regulations, codes, and other rules related to the public health and safety? Do we have the jurisdiction to do that? And the second question would be, do we do it on every street light? Or every, uh, or every stop sign? Or anything in Caltrans' jurisdiction? I don't think we do. Right. What I can say is there are there are improvements along PCH in which our our public works department would review as long uh, as well as planning staff. Well, uh, you know what, to the extent to the extent that we don't have jurisdiction, the language of the condition is pretty irrelevant. I mean, the, okay. the rules are going to be the rules, and I'm, mm -hmm. so I'm not sure. So let me go through these. I think it's my motion would be to add insurance. To add the word reasonable um, to uh, condition number one. Um, okay, and uh, now I would also say that uh, a notice to Caltrans on number 30, I mean to uh, Verizon is appropriate. And speak up if somebody doesn't like what I'm motioning here. Um, Number 36, I think we removed that last time because there is no equipment underground on the, other than the meter, correct? So I think we removed that last time. So I would remove that. 43A, we just discussed that. And I think we agreed to remove it. Is that correct? We'll uh, find out. Yeah, and then 53, um, I think, as with all city uh, planning things, we always give some of the people the 
right to correct. Uh, so I would take that out also, and that's my motion. <clears throat> John, may I just ask staff whether the 12 months notice is a reasonable time period uh, need to remove it? I mean, is that too long in terms of the needs of the city? Well, it's also whether they need from, you know, demolition permit or whatever you need to get. I mean, it's fine with me if it's fine with, uh, you know, Tyler and our consultant and Richard. I'm sorry, what condition was that? 53. 53. 53. And the, the second question would be, do we remove it last time? We're going to continue to do these. We ought to correct our conditions. Right. Uh, last time, the commission only wanted us to amend two of the conditions, add, add additional language. That was it. OK. So what about 53? Is that something that? Uh, it, it, Oh, well, that, uh, go ahead. Can, 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 I just want to make sure. Maybe I'm reading it wrong. I see the language that that they that they discuss in 54. Correct, Tyler. That the that, that the wireless you know uh, right of way permit will expire without further action by the city. I see that in, in condition of approval number 54, not 53. Substantively, it's it, it's accurate. I just want to make sure that we're all we're all clear. Okay, it, so it, I would amend correct. I would amend it to 54 if uh, I get a. Uh, Is there anything anybody else wants me to add to the uh, motion? Well, David just pointed out it was number 30 with the 12 month period. You guys didn't really answer that. Staff didn't respond to that, whether that was needed or not. I just didn't know if that was too long or the right amount of time as far as the city is concerned. Chair, if I could jump in, is it- Yes, please. <laughs> is it possible for us to take a, a 10 minute recess uh, so that staff could better look into the concern that Commissioner Hill brought up about the public notice? Um, sure, we can certainly do that, but let's, uh, i tell you what, let's, let's put a pin in that. And um, I, want, I want to get some of Commissioner Hill's other comments so that there may be other things that you might want to take a look at. Um, so John, um, Tell you what, why don't we hold your motion in abeyance, if that's all right, for the time being. Um, move forward with uh, some comments. I, uh, Mr. Commissioner Hill has indicated he's got other comments he wants to make. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, and then we'll take our recess and see if we can't come back and actually make some progress. Um, hey, so, at that point, can I just say motion as made? Remember? Yes, absolutely. Okay, yeah. Great, OK. Yeah. Um, and we'll have to get a second on it, of course. Craig. Yeah, uh, okay, so I, I have questions or issues on three different variance findings, but first, before we get to that, a uh, couple of quick things. Uh, matters of safety, um, just as it's sort of going forward, looking at this and all the other ones coming before us, they're all in the public right away. In the past three or four decades, I've experienced about a dozen power outages uh, due to someone hitting power poles on, on PCH. And so I'm, I'm concerned that there's no documentation in, of, of the safety of these things about if we're co-locating on fixtures on poles that are uh, vulnerable to being knocked down, what happens, uh, for example, do these automatically shut down if the pole is compromised? Uh, otherwise, if the unit is still functional and it could be halfway to the ground radiating at a different angle and, you know, hitting bystanders or could, is it more liable to start an electrical fire and then just the light fixture itself would be? I don't know that, that we, we've seen any documentation of the safety of putting these as a matter of habit or practice right next to the highway. It's, it's that for staff, is that something that we've looked at and addressed? Are we comfortable doing that just up and down the city? Oh, well, you want to get responses now or you want to wait until you... Uh... Well, if you're taking notes, I'll, I'll keep going. But yeah, I would either way, whatever. Richard, you take notes. Um, go ahead, Greg. OK. All right. Um, not sure what we decided about the pollution insurance. So put a pin on that. Um, 
Uh, question about the backup battery. How many hours does that last? It seems to me like it should probably be 72 hours if we're in a, a fire emergency state. We've just gone through 72 hours of real uncertainty on this other fire where I've got Topanga evacuees staying with me. Um, what's the battery backup time? Do we know? I don't think that information was disclosed to us. Uh, if Daisy could answer that. Why don't we get Daisy? Why don't we get Daisy up to uh, to talk about both of those questions you've asked, uh, Craig? Uh, both the the effect of a collision with a car and um, battery backup time. So, can you unmute Daisy for us? Yeah. Okay, Commissioner Hill. Um, thank you for your questions. Um, <clears throat> on the first item, so the reason we're doing a replacement street light is because it actually um, makes the pole structurally more sound, right? to hold our equipment. And uh, part of our submission includes structural analysis. And um, SEE has also vetted um, the pole integrity uh, for our poles. They, and that's par partly why there's limited designs because Malibu is in a specific range of zones also for seismic. So therefore, um, all of that has been taken into account, um, including the loading of our equipment. Now, with regards to a hypothetical situation where say somebody hits the pole, it would be just like any other pole that SE has that where the pole would get knocked down. If power goes out, our site goes out. You need four components for a cell site to operate. You need radio, antennas, power, and fiber. So if power is out, site's out. There's no um, exposure that's being given to anybody when a site is down. Um, and then an alarm actually also goes off for our stuff. I hope that answers that particular question. Well, on that question, so they don't, there's no automatic shutoff if, for example, the circuit is suddenly compromised. It doesn't, um, I don't know, the, the other part of my question was fire hazard, whether this was a, a bigger deal than just a, an, an electrical hazard from a, a mere light fixture. Um, if uh, we follow all the requirements for fire code, um, that is, and it's been vetted also and mentioned in the staff report. Um, for this particular uh, type of installation. And um, we also follow SE safety standards as far as that goes. It just so, seems funny um, to me. It, it seems odd to me that the, the it's Pacific Coast Highway, it's, it's pretty much almost a freeway and we're putting these poles every thousand or 1500 feet all along it as we go. It seems like we're, we're asking for something that we don't have documentation yet that that really works. We're just taking your word for it. Um, As well, I mentioned, okay, so uh, we... okay, go ahead, go Daisy, ahead. and let's get to the second question, the battery backup. Battery backup. So the battery backup unit. So this was actually an offering that we provide for Malibu that has not been provided for any other city. Um, this was after the Woolsey fire. And so it's a, it's a new um, thing that we're offering. And the approximate time right now for a backup that we're looking at is between two to three hours um, for the BBU to operate. Um, that's compared to nothing right now. Um, there's no battery backup at the moment versus us providing two to three hours uh, of battery backup with this particular BBU. Small Richard, cells are different than macros where they have generators. Um, we don't have generators for this particular location, so. Right. Uh, that's a bigger question that might be for Richard about just what is the standard of, of backup time that we're the state of the art as it were. I mean, we're talking about being backed up and ready for a, like a fire emergency. Two hours is definitely not it. Are we just saying, well, fine, we're not going to be using these towers then when we have a fire? So, the, the, go ahead, Richard. Sure. As the, the folks from Verizon have pointed out, it, it is something actually that um, I think our previous city manager uh, had solicited uh, backup and, and redundancy from the, the cell phone providers. Uh, but at present, there are no requirements that they actually give us so many hours of backup. Uh, obviously, you're right, Commissioner Hill, we would like it to be as long as possible because uh, these sites provide information not only to the residents in the event of evacuation, but also the fire department, police agencies, everyone uses them. Yeah. Uh, but I think right. For example, the water pump backups we have in Big Rock, I think, maybe I'm wrong, but I think it's like 48 hours that they've got on, on that. Um, 
So that that might be something to add in a condition if we could say that we need more. If I could add, Commissioner Hill, the um, the length of time also would depend on the size as well. So like we're seeing with the new Senate bill that rolled out, a lot of the macro facilities are coming in with uh, their backup generators. And those generators happen to be a lot larger than this one, eight feet tall, uh, you know, I wanna say 20 times the size of this little this little guy. They only have so much room to work with in the public right of way. And so requiring a, a larger generator might not be feasible um, just to throw that out there. Okay. Okay, moving on to my concerns about the variance findings. Right. Uh, there, you know, we need to show special circumstances or exceptional characteristics. I don't know that I see that. Um, at the last meeting, we talked about how there is a poll already designed that integrates um, the gear into the poll without requiring that the poll be any taller, that they wouldn't need the variance for this. And at that point, they said, yeah, um, that poll exists. We'd be happy to use it. It's just not on Edison's list. So that to me feels like the next step would be to say, well, Verizon and Edison, why don't you guys get together and see if, you know, why is that not on the list? Maybe that's another question for Daisy. Is, is it just, maybe it's a matter of just having a, a conversation with Edison about here, this is the poll that we'd like to use. And have you even asked them if you want to use that poll yet? She's muted. She's muted. Unmute Daisy, please. She's now unmuted. Sorry, Daisy, I, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, my apologies. I was <laughs> double muted. <laughs> uh, so, um, but to answer your question, Commissioner, um, yeah, we do work with Edison. Edison um, goes and, and sits down with the carriers on a regular basis, probably every few years to go over designs and whatnot. Um, what was discussed at the previous um, previous hearing was mainly in reference to, and it's actually referred to slightly in the staff report as well, is if Verizon were to build our own poll, like a new poll in the right away, as opposed to replacing an Edison poll, then we have a lot more flexibility on, on the design because um, we would be able to perhaps, you know, look at, you know, possible integrated options depending on the technology we're trying to build. Now with Edison, we only have a couple of flavors as mentioned. The one that you saw last time, um, last uh, um, planning commission hearing, and then this particular design for Edison. Um, and a lot of that is based not just on, on the looks and aesthetics of it, but also structural integrity, as mentioned. Malibu has certain seismic requirements. And, um, and you know, there's only so much um, that Edison will let us do. So we do work with them on a regular basis. It's just that, um, the difference here is that you know we're opting to co-locate on an existing pole as opposed to planting a new pole in the right of way, which is disfavored in the city. So, so that's you, usually not our first option. So you're saying Edison actively and affirmatively denied a request to to put in a pole that would integrate the gear in a standard height. Um, no, I would not. I would not go that far. I cannot speak for Edison. I can only speak for the options that they give us. So the options they give us are the two designs that you've seen so far. And I'm saying that if Verizon were to um, install a new pole in the public right away, we would have more flexibility to work with manufacturers with regard to the aesthetics. And, okay, and that's, that's what I'm suggesting. I'm just nudging on it that maybe there's a conversation with them be, because I heard at the last meeting that that pole is a, presumably a viable option. So. Well, I'm not sure that it really speaks to the issue of the decision we have to make tonight. I mean, it would certainly be great if they could all get together and come up with a better kind of a poll, but I don't yeah. think that's okay. going to solve uh, the problem. Finding three of the variants, um, special privilege. Uh, we have reported that, well, it seems that there's really a small minority of polls in Malibu that are over height now. And I don't know, what, what Richard, that would be what, maybe a couple percent at most of the polls in the city are over height? He's muted. I believe so, Tyler, because I'm trying to think of what we saw. I mean, we, we are going to do a survey that, that's starting shortly, but based off of what we've seen lately, the majority of the polls, right, it, they're your standard. Uh, so so uh, my, my concern is that this would, in fact, constitute a special privilege. I mean, it, we haven't <laughs> installed a bunch of other ones yet, so 
we'd, we'd be setting the precedent right now. And at, at present, it still is a special privilege. It's um, not in the case of, uh, of, of of what other carriers would be able to do, and that's how we looked at it. Because the wireless facilities are in of in of themselves a special uh, type of application. It's not just a streetlight pole. So, yeah, according to the rest of the streetlight poles, yeah, it looks a little different. But uh, what we would allow other carriers to do, it is not a um, special privilege, and that's how we looked at it. Um. Okay, but we're but the variance is for the height of a light pole, so we're comparing it to all the other light poles. But uh, uh, Craig, this pole is over the limit. So that's what I'm saying. Well, apparently, every pole on Coast Highway is, because they all look exactly like this one. Oh, because they the the pole is 28, but the luminaire is at 30 something. Yeah. Yeah. The general average of what I've seen so far for a general street light is about 30 feet tall. Mm. Without okay, so finding so finding my last one finding five yeah. uh, regarding the ESHA, most of the good coverage on the map is displaying uh, in the ESHA that's immediately next to the enclave building north of here. Most of the good coverage is right up there. Um, so in finding five, the, the word adjacent is used with regard to, it can't be done if it's adjacent to ESHA. And I know in the context of, if we're talking about a building, adjacent would mean immediately next door. But we already have an or, uh, precedent with the dark sky ordinance with respect to affecting ESHA, whereby you're not allowed to broadcast your light onto ESHA over some distance such that you you can't have more than 0 0.01 foot candles on ESHA or that's too bright. That implies that you're pretty far away. So we're talking about the electromagnetic spectrum and just different frequencies in it, whether it's light or, or what's being broadcast here now. So that to me implies that the definition of adjacent should mean nearby as it does in the dark sky ordinance. It's, it's and we're we're within a hundred feet, less than a hundred feet of this big swath of Esha here. So, I don't know that we can't say that this isn't too close to Esha for the uh, requirements of the ordinance. Uh, Craig, let me ask you a question: uh, yeah. Wouldn't that preclude any cell service for any canyon in Malibu? I, I, I guess it depends. It depends on how much you say nearby, because it seems to me like yeah. Nearby wouldn't be the entire 1500 foot range of a tower because it falls off exponentially. And likewise with dark sky ordinance, you don't say, oh, if I can see that little light two miles away, that means it's too bright. There's some reasonable distance that you're talking about. It's it's having a, uh, what's the word I want? It's, it's, it's a moving effect. It's not just the tower, it's everything that radiates from, out from it in an exponentially dropping off way. So if you're, I would say with, if you're within 100 feet of that, you're pretty much adjacent to it still. Okay, so let's, let's. But Richard, you wanted to have a few uh, minutes to look at some things. Let's take that break now. It's now 8.40 by my clock. Let's come back at 8.30 and you have a chance to uh, do whatever it is you wanted to do and deal with uh, the questions that Craig has raised as well. Everybody, please turn off your camera.
Okay. All right, we're back. We're back in session. Richard, did you have the chance to take a look at the what you wanted to take a look at? Uh, Chair Jennings, if I if I may jump in. Patrick? Um, Mm -hmm. So, so after Commissioner's Hill, Commissioner Hill's comment about that public notice, of course, staff began to look into it, and, and they did notice, you know, at the very beginning, some irregularities with it, uh, lots of returned um, notices, etc. Further investigation into it basically led staff to confirm that the, the, the notice was not done properly, i.e., some of the data provided. And I'm not sure staff is going to have to investigate this to figure out what happened. Um, but, but the long and short of it is that some of the neighboring properties did not properly receive the the, the notice for this um and so with with that this item like you know does need to be continued okay can i ask you a question um is the other item the same way the one we had last week you mean no don't we have two uh two polls this week no i no. don't think so one, okay so i move we continue to where? Uh, to when? Date uncertain? What's our shot clock like? Look, look like? Well, we have to be noticed, so um, I think date uncertain would probably be prudent. Richard, because, your call. Yeah, uh, Pat, correct me if I'm wrong, but because we're going to need to re-notice this, we need to give the applicant time to prepare current labels, check them, and then we will be submitting a new or sending out a new public notice, correct? Correct. Yes. Why? Why would they need new labels? Maybe because the labels were wrong this time. Let's just move it on and try to get something actually done tonight. Um, my move is my motion is to continue to a day. Is, is there a second? I second. Kathleen, call the roll, please. <clears throat> Commissioner Maza. Yes. Vice Chair Weil. Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Chair Jennings? Yes. Motion carries. All right, that includes item 5A. Let's go to 5B. This is Coastal Development Permit Amendment 20-018, an application amending Coastal Development Permit 16-050. This is of the property at 27218 Pacific Coast Highway. Can I have a staff report, please? Good evening, Chair Young and um, members of the Public Commission. Um, I'm David Eng, case planner for this application before you at 27218 Pacific Coast Highway. Next slide, please. Uh, so this property is located east of Point Dune on Escondido uh, Beach. Next slide. The project's um, the project site um, is a beachfront family residence, uh, residential parcel, excuse me. Um, it is addressed at as uh, 27218 Pacific Coast Highway. Um, this project or this property, like others um, on the stretch of highway west of uh, via Escondido, are accessed by a park road, Escondido Beach Road. Next slide. So um, the application before um, you tonight is to amend Coastal Development Permit Number 16-050, and this is to allow a 312 square foot uh, second story addition to a previously approved single family dwelling. Um, in January 18, uh, 2018, the Planning Commission approved CDC Number 16-050. And that was to approve a, um, a 576 uh, square foot net addition um, and an interior and exterior remodel to an existing 2,728 uh, square foot two story uh, beach rent single family residence. Uh, included a streamlined uh, modification uh, review for a six foot wide deck uh, extension on the first floor. And a new second, a new second floor deck and demolition permit for a uh, 146 square foot demolition of the first floor and less than 50% demolition of the exterior walls. Um, here in the red, you can see uh, uh, the proposed addition, which will be loaded right above the garage. Next slide. Um, 
first edition, we will remain within the required setback um, and the footprint of the house. And as this illustration shows, uh, it will be consistent with uh, the 22 foot four inch uh, roof height of the other portions of the uh, currently approved residence. Next slide. Uh, so this is a photograph taken from uh, the edge of uh, Pacific Coast Highway and down into Escondido Beach Road. Here you see the uh, dwelling, which is currently under construction for the previously approved um, additions and alterations. And um, in the green circle, the grass circle, you'll see the uh, wooden story poles that the applicant has directed, um, showing the extent of the proposed addition. Next slide. Um, these photos uh, show the property and the story poles from two vantage points um, from Pacific Coast Highway. Uh, the addition would be most publicly visible, um, limited due to the location of dwelling at a lower elevation from the scenic route, and also due to existing screening uh, from existing fencing and vegetation. Next slide. And um, with this amendment, um, all four findings of the original coastal development permit are still able to be made. Uh, based on this and all the other findings in the made on the record, staff is recommending approval of the coastal development permit amendment number uh, uh, 20-018 um, to allow the proposed addition to the previously approved dwelling. Um, staff, uh, the applicant and the owner are available uh, for any questions, and that concludes my presentation. Thanks. All right, thank you, David. Uh, <clears throat> disclosures, John? None. Craig? I just had a conversation with Richard, and one thing that came up was what's going on with that water main, but that's not really our concern, so I think that's good. Um, David? I visited the site the last time this was before us and spoke with a representative of the team uh, this time, uh, but nothing that isn't uh, in the report. I should say I spoke with a, with the owner also, um, so no, nothing new. Dennis? Um, I went last time, same as Commissioner Wiles, uh, talked with uh, Mr. Halley, nothing new here. I didn't go this time. Uh, okay, and nothing for me. I had a brief conversation with Scott Halley, but uh, not of any substance. Um, all right, so let's. Uh, who's on the Who's uh, on the team, uh, uh, Kathleen? Who's Who's speaking for this project? We have the applicant team of Scott Halley and Wayne Chevalier. Okay, and do we know who's speaking for them? Which one wants to go first? I have Scott Halley listed first. Okay, great. And are there other public speakers listed? Uh, no, those are the only two. Okay, so let's open up Scott's microphone, please. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Scott, uh, you and Wayne together have 15 minutes. Uh, you can use it all or you can save some for rebuttal, although there doesn't appear to be any other speakers. Um, and of course, you don't have to use all your 15 minutes if you don't want to. Um, yeah, well, I, I, at this point, I think, you know, we've, we're, we're kind of uh, going along with the staff's recommendation is I think we'll just we'll just leave it at that. And if you have any questions for us, you know, we're available to answer them. But I don't know. I don't need to to go through the whole process again and just waste everyone's time. It's it's a pretty simple project. So at that, I'd like to just hear your guys' comments and uh, hopefully we can move forward with it. All right, thank you, Scott. Um, that being the case, we will close the public hearing. Uh, we're now back at the commission table for questions or motions. Uh, John, I see your hand up. Yeah, um, can I see the uh, picture of it from across the street that was just presented? <clears throat> That's slide. Uh, what? Uh, that would be slide seven, Alex. The photograph. There you go. Are those, is that foliage permitted? I mean, it is blocking coastal views. Yeah, I noticed somebody's put a hedge in next to it. Was that in any landscape plan or permitted? 
Um, unfortunately, I don't know if that um, was um, if that's part of the approved landscape plan. However, um, these are individual um, plantings that um, I don't believe they were intended to be a hedge, but um, perhaps well, one of the left, of course, is a hedge. But yeah, but uh, these uh, are uh, pretty large. Sure. Can I ask Scott if they've been permitted? You can, Scott. You want to open up your open up Scott's microphone, please, Kathleen. Are you hearing me okay now? We hear yeah. you now. Yeah, you've okay, heard. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, this, heard... these are these 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 bushes are are they've been there for for years. They were there before we even started the project. Um, the hedge to the left, obviously, is a hedge that you know we had nothing to do with. It was that was that looks a pretty manicured hedge. But these these plants are. Um, they were they were never um they were grandfathered in as far as i'm concerned i've, I've not when we bought it they were there and uh, i'm sure we could get some historical photos if we had to but we did not we didn't touch any of that stuff on that side of the road so so that's uh they just grew up so i can't i can't control that okay um if nobody else has a, uh, any questions i'm i move as staff recommended with two additions i'd like to add the dark standard dark sky provision and the standard poison provision to the conditions. Um, second that. Yes, now, Richard, uh, you uh, or David or Patrick know what the standard provisions you're talking about are? Yes, we do. And okay. you can add those as uh, requested by the, if, as put in the commissioner Mazel's menu, or, or excuse me, <laughs> amend, uh, his amended, uh, Recommend right. you can add them in. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Let's, uh, is there further discussion? Hearing none, let's call the roll, Kathleen. Commissioner Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Vice Chair Weil? Yes. Chair Jennings? Yes. Motion carries. All right, that includes uh, item 5B. We're now at item 5D. This is the, the uh, Conditional use permit for the uh, use of the uh, city owned parcel known as the Chili Cook Off site by the Malibu Farmers Market. We have a staff report, please. Uh, good evening, Chair Jennings and members of the Planning Commission. The next item on the agenda is conditional use permit amendment number 21 001 for a project located at 23575 Civic Center Way. Next slide, please. The subject property is located on the northeast corner of Stewart Ram French Road and Civic Center Way. The subject property is, is accessed from Civic Center Way. The red star in the aerial photo indicates where the proposed offsite parking will be located, which is a city owned vacant parcel, also known as the Chili Cook Off site. The yellow star in the aerial photo indicates the location of the existing farmers market. The operations will remain unchanged in this location. Next slide, please. The applicant is seeking to utilize the vacant lot, the Chili Cook Off site, adjacent to the existing farmer's market location to provide off-street parking for his patrons due to the displacement of their parking due to the construction of the Santa Monica College. City Council adopted ordinance number 456 to address temp temporary use permits for temporary off-site parking for the farmer's market. This provision shall expire the earlier of the issuance of a certificate of occupancy for the Santa Monica College or on January 1st, 2022. For City Council Ordinance Number 456, however, an amendment of Conditional Use Permit Number 09003 is required to allow for the parking to be relocated with a temporary use permit. Consistent with the discussion that took place at the November 25th, 2019 City Council hearing. Other conditions of approval of Planning Commission Resolution Number 0958 would remain in effect. Next slide, please. Here we have the proposed site plan. The applicant is proposing to provide parking for up to 300 cars on site. The Americans with Disabilities Act ADA compliant parking will continue to be provided at the farmer's market location. Next slide, please. And here we have a photograph of the existing ADA parking at the existing farmer's market location. Next slide, please. And I wanted to amend the condition, um, swapping out the condition on the resolution number six for this one. 
a condition number six in the uh, resolution that you guys received was a condition that's applicable for development projects. Uh, since this is a condition of use permit uh, amendment, this is the condition that applies. And I would like to read it for the record. This condition of use permit shall not be effective until all appeals are exhausted and the property owner, applicant, and the business operator execute the affidavit of acceptance of conditions. Said documents shall be recorded with the Los Angeles County Recorder and a certified copy of said recordation shall be filed with the planning department within 10 days of the effective date of approval. Next slide, please. And before I move on to the summary, I wanted to address three pieces of correspondence that was submitted by the applicant. I got an opportunity to uh, speak with her over the phone and the correspondence was uh, distributed to the commission. The first piece of correspondence, she states that the language on page four uh, under the project description needs to be changed. Um, I just wanna state that it is, it is implied that once the construction of the Santa Monica College is, is completed, then the, the farmer's market operations will return to the, its original location. And that's what she wanted to address in this correspondence. And I quote, this provision shall expire upon completion of the construction of the Santa Monica College building and restoration of the Malibu farmer's market site to its original configuration and use. So again, that is stated, that is implied in the, in the condition use permit amendment that that is in fact what's gonna happen after construction is completed. The second piece of correspondence that she submitted is regarding the hours of operation. So again, this amendment is specific to the parking only. After clarifying this correspondence with the applicant, the hours of operation that she's requesting is just for the parking. So she wants to request a set up time to begin at 6.30 in the morning and cleanup completed by 6 p.m. So that hours of operation is just specific to the parking alone. Um, the hours of operation for the actual farmer's market will remain unchanged. And that is stated in page four of the, of the staff report. The hours of operation for the farmer's market remains unchanged at 7 a.m. and completed by 5 p.m. And the last piece of correspondence was in regards to a liquor license. She just wanted us to remove um, on the staff report on page four, there's a subsection regarding the liquor license. And there we just stated that for planning commission resolution number 0958, there shall be no sale of alcohol either for consumption, on-site or, or packaged. Again, that is just restating what was allowed under the original condition of use permit. Uh, and again, this is just for parking alone, but that was something that we wrote in the staff report just to reiterate no other changes are proposed. Okay, thank you. With, with you, that, you want to summarize? Summary? In summary, staff recommends that the Planning Commission adopt resolution number 21-11, approving the proposed project as condition. This concludes my presentation. The applicant and staff are available for any questions you may have. All right, thank you, Didier. Uh, disclosures, please. Um, uh, Dennis. None. Gone. I talked to Deborah Bianco a couple times last week. Nothing other than the staff report. Great. So visited the market. Great. None. None. David. None. Me, none. Uh, let's open the public hearing. So we, we have, the, Go ahead. the applicant, uh, Deborah Bianco. Okay. Anybody that, else? No, sir. That is. I, I'm sorry, Kathleen. I'm, just, 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 I'm sorry. Deborah uh, Bianco is the only speaker. Is the only speaker. Okay, right. fine. Uh, let's open her microphone, please. Can hear me? Uh, now yes. we can hear you, yes. Am I supposed to go over everything that I requested? You you have 15 minutes. You can do anything you want, Deborah. but you heard uh, the staff report, I assume, and um, the, the, I know that we all got the pieces of correspondence that you sent in, uh, and uh, if you have uh, if, if you're willing to just accept questions from the commission, should there be any, then you don't have to make a presentation. If you want to make a presentation, you're free to do that. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, I just want to reiterate that I we realize that this is strictly for parking. Um, okay. I think that if you need to ask me some questions, I'd like to be here for you, but we, we know what we're requesting. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing. 
Yeah, could you? If, if Stan, Hang on, guys. Is this any better? They're much better. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I said I'd like to be here for you if you have any questions. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. I have a question to Stan. Uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's just a second. Uh, let's close the public hearing and we'll come back to the commission table. Uh, John, you have a question to staff? Yeah, uh, Didier, you just, uh, is it Didier? Yeah. 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 Uh, you just read off three things. Uh, your first one, uh, you are saying now that it expires upon the completion of the college. You've changed the language that says, January 1st? No, no, no. Sorry. I just omitted that. So uh, it's the whatever comes first, the uh, construction or January 1st, 2022. Okay. Now, if the college is not completed, that means that they have no parking. So can we amend that to the, the have it expire upon the certificate of uh, occupancy for the college? I'm not sure if that needs to come from city council itself, and that's tied to ordinance 456. Uh, Richard? So, well, I, w I wanted to jump in here. I already have alerted uh, the city manager's office uh, to this. Um, ordinance 456 <laughs> put a, a date that they expected the college would be done in January of next year, which I think it's about another year out is what I'm hearing. So we will, uh, at the planning department, we're going to bring this back to the city council so that we could extend that ordinance. Um, ideally, I think the thing to say is that uh, the farmer's market would be able to use this parking until a certificate of, um, uh, uh, we call it a CFC, or I'm sorry. Certificate of occupancy. Certificate of occupancy, I keep thinking of CSEs, a certificate of occupancy has been issued. Uh, so we can just make this basically follow that is what um, DDA was trying to say. But essentially, I do need to go back to the council and ask the council to change that ordinance. Okay, so can we say in the motion that uh, it will expire upon the provisions of that ordinance and then we don't have to come back here again? So if they, if the ordinance right now says January 1st, 2022 or 2021, I guess, um, 2022, if, and be, if before that date they change the ordinance, then it won't ever have to come back to us. We're not saying January 2022, we would say as per the ordinance. As specified in the amendment, whatever it is, uh, as amended. Right. Is that, is that okay, Patrick? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess. Could we, I mean, I mean, is there, I would, I would think we should have a somewhat of a, of a date certain unless otherwise extended by, by, by the ordinance. That way there isn't this kind of potential okay. nebulous gray area. So let's have a date. And then we could say, unless otherwise extended. So uh, why don't we do put, that, John? That, that, make, that, that covers the Okay. Issue. So that's going to be uh, uh, in the motion. That's that we got to state that. Okay. Uh, okay. Now. The other problem I see here is the condition that this requires TUPs, okay? Number one, it takes 25 days to get a TUP. You need a TUP every weekend. And there's a lot of weekends in there. Now, I don't see why it requires a TUP because the zone code section that they changed, 19-65, excludes the counting of these dates as against the TUP limit. So I would like to eliminate the requirement for a TUP uh, because they are excluded in that zone in zone zone text amendment number 1965. That way we don't bury the world with paperwork um, just for a parking lot that's going to be there temporarily. Now, is that something we can do? I'm reading off the uh, the staff's ordinance number 456. 
which I got from Richard today. And if you want me, I can read it to you, the, the section. So I have that section up. I, I never mentioned it. it, it what it, what it does is it says it doesn't count towards TUP usage. Right. But it doesn't say it requires it either. The I I did go back and look at the city council hearing that took place, and I I did watch that meeting uh, to make certain that you know. To, that we were doing this right, quite frankly. And in that meeting, uh, and Pat's welcome to opine on this, uh, they did bring up the, you know, the, the need to park the farmer's market there. And they also were acknowledging that this is gonna be something that, you know, if we do it once a week, we're talking 52 times a year, far greater than the 16 days allowed by a TUP. And it's my understanding from the council meeting that what they were attempting to do was one, separate this from parking as a standalone use, and two, say more generally that a TUP could be issued to allow the, the farmer's market to relocate their parking over there and essentially the TUP regulates that. I do agree this, this is totally confusing. Uh, because one would assume that a conditional use permit just lets you move right over. But the fear was that a conditional use permit would, you know, that typically authorizes a, a use. And so that would essentially be authorizing this parking lot, or excuse me, this vacant parcel to have a use on it of a parking lot without a use, uh, like a access, like a building or something like that. And so I, whether they overthought it or whatever the deal was at that time, when staff presented it to the council, they really believed that there was a concern this could be looked at as just a standalone parking lot. And so the TUP was the mechanism that would prevent that from happening. I wanna add one thing to that though. Um, this is not a CUP that goes on forever, like every other CUP. This has a limited expiration. So it's not authorizing a use of the property uh, well, over a long-term period of time. And uh, I think it's a burden on the applicant and on the city. Well, if, if we go with the route of a, a TUP every weekend, that's maybe a hundred TUPs and um, it, it's, you're not allowed to have 100 TUPs. So one way or the other, you can't get more than 16. So it's a catch 22 if we allow, if we just say the CUP is allowing this use on a temporary basis, we aren't stuck in this catch 22 where this, the staff theoretically can't issue the TUPs. But in theory, it's not only allowing it for the, for the farmer's market, it's allowing it for anybody else who gets to, you know, if the farmer's market suddenly ceases operation and somebody else wants to, you know, it, that you have some problems with, with, the, with the way you're going. And think about it, the TUP can simply be copied over, you know, it's gonna be identical week to week to week. So the burden will mainly be on the city, not on the applicant, Craig, well, you had your hand. If you, if you can get 16 instances per TUP, then maybe you just need to renew it quarterly or even a third of the oh, year. No, you get 16 TUP. So, uh, and Pat, you could jump in here and tell me if I'm wrong sure. on this, but it, effectively as Commissioner Mazza said, this would, pull parking out of the special event category, the, the 16 day uh, limitation or, or, and then I think what the council was trying to achieve here was that perhaps we can maybe just have her apply for a TUP for the year um, since she's not bound by, like in a, like a party event. <clears throat> right, yeah, as long as, yeah, I, I believe that that's consistent in terms of that those kind of the temporary use permit, this is a bit different as long as the same kind of operational requirements, the same hours are, are, are all applicable. That, that, that sounds fine. So we would say one TUP for the year for 
calendar year or until it expires? Because this thing's going to expire in, in six months if, unless the council changes the the rules. Now, I don't. I missed Jeff's comment on how this would apply to other people. It's only this. This CUP is only for the farmers market. Um, look, it, if if it's one for six months or every other six months, it's it's really not a burden on anybody. Uh, let's just go with one for six months. <clears throat> it can be renewed. That gives you, uh, you know, what, six or eight over the course of the period of time. And um, I, I don't think it's going to be a problem for, for anybody if you do that. Yeah, we just need to get these folks a place to park, for gosh sakes. It seems yeah. like it's taken a long time. Well, it's yeah. taken two years, and now we're adding another 25 days to it. But okay. Um, now, <clears throat> let's see here. Uh, condition number five requires digital plans. There are no plans. I mean, there's, there's a, you know, do, can we get rid of condition number five? And essentially it's the site plan, which we already have on file. So you don't need that in digital, do you? I have it digital. Okay. You already got it. Yeah. Okay. So we don't need to do five is okay. Um, now the other one is the, the striping. Yes, and the applicant actually had some issues with that, that she she uh, felt that it was a burden or that it was going to be um, an unnecessary cost. Um, and she can speak on that. I had a phone conversation with her prior to the meeting, and she is open for any other options that you guys can give her uh, in removing those conditions. Well, I speak on that one, too. I was going to I was going to suggest. See, we there's going to be other tenants. There's going to be other TUPs on that property. Randomly, they have film crews parked there. Randomly, they have other things. And that's going to mess up all this stuff. Uh, and then it's got to be, so those TUPs will have to require replacement and blah, 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 blah. And so I wanted to get a more generic um, term instead of the 14, 15, and 16. I wanted to say something like, okay, and you guys can improve on it or not like it, but uh, parking shall be delineated as necessary to provide safety and directional signage. And that way the city can say, you know, it's very broad. You might have 10 cars parked there. You're not going to have 300. Um, um, you can see if it's done right or you can correct it. But to say you got to mark out 300 spaces every time somebody messes them up, which will be frequent in the winter. Um, okay, we get the point. Craig, you had a comment on that? Yeah, I, a couple constructive thoughts about it. First, let me just say, I just was on a road trip in, in the Mojave and Death Valley, and there are plenty of points of interest where people spontaneously park without any lines, and people are smart enough to organize themselves and park pretty closely. It seems to me that the, the one issue here is if you want to have it in a couple different rows, then you would need uh, a monitor or either a monitor to come out and, and once one side starts to fill up, somebody comes out and says, hey guys, next row, just start it right here so there's enough space. And then they can walk away. Once sure. that's started, people will see it and they'll park next to it and it'll fill in. Um, so that that's one thought, just to have that sort of occasional monitor. Another thing, tool you could have that would help would be bollards, like plastic bollards you could have for the handicap or the disabled parking. You could just have a couple of those with uh, the blue and white signs posted on them and just stick those out. And that would be enough to say this is the part the area for that without having to put lines on the ground. You could do the same thing with highway cones. Uh, highway cones. And, and, and the thing about it is, is that there are, you know, this is city property. Um, I don't think it's a really a good idea from a liability standpoint for to say, oh, just park wherever you want to. I mean, that's fine. Um, I think it's it, I think it's appropriate for the city to say, look, you've got to do it in a safe way. You've got to have 26 foot minimum aisles. You've got to have, uh, as far as the individual parking spaces, maybe not, but at least you need to have some sort of delineation of the aisles. Secondly, all of that can be handled through the TUP. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be spelled out in the CUP. Uh, because okay. the staff always has the opportunity to say, look, this is the way we want you to do it when the TUP comes in front of them. 
So okay. uh, I just wanted to point out to Craig that the handicap parking is not on this lot. It's on the library lot. Um, I thought there was some comment that it was needed here, but be that as it may, I, the, the point is that you can delineate that without necessarily having to paint lines. Okay. Uh, then the last thing, and I'm being an advocate for another issue, but a lot of our wineries got bur burned or suffered in the last, in the COVID thing. And I think we should allow them, Malibu Winery, Malibu Appalachian only, to do wine tasting at this event. It's not a bar, they're not selling liquor, uh, whatever. It's uh, that, that has to do with the with the CUP itself for the for the for the farmers market. We're just talking about parking here. Not okay. gonna be drinking wine in the parking lot. Um, Why? tailgate parties. Okay, so I, I'd like to make a motion if there's no more comments. Yeah, then, well, I have one comment. I, I just on the um, if there's any possibility that the city might want to be doing something with the remainder of the parcel at some point, is there a, a clear documented need that 300 spaces is what they need? Could they do uh, well, it with 200 well, well, or why, why is it? We're going to eliminate that in my motion, but the part of the uh, conditions here are that it's not exclusive use. The city can give another TUP for somebody else right. at the same time. So okay. I'm not, I, I just, I want to guard against the possibility that we're reserving too many spaces for this use. It, it, I, I mean, maybe 300 is, is, I don't know what they need, but just to. Well, I'll tell you what, this is, all, all of this is arguing more in the favor of more frequent TUPs as far as yeah. I can see, uh, because <laughs> you've got to be able, you can control these aspects that you're talking about through the, through the application of a TUP. And that's for other people to use it, not these people. So what I'd like to make a motion is, uh, let's see. Staff well, recommendations start and then. Well, yeah, staff recommendations. And then um, the first one was that, that the, C, the CUP, um, can be extended by the change in the ordinance, is that? how we would say it, Richard? I think what, what Patrick suggested was that it terminate on the day specified, uh, or unless, unless uh, otherwise. Unless right. otherwise. <laughs> okay, and then yeah, so for my, just for the, for the record, we would say the CUP shall expire the earlier of the issuance of a certificate of occupancy for Santa Monica College or on January 1st, 2022, unless amended per city council ordinance. Okay. The second one is uh, TUP shall be granted in six month increments. Okay, and the third one shall be, uh, I'd like to say parking uh, shall be, uh, shall be uh, controlled as per TUP requirements. There you go, that gets us off the hook. Instead of 300 and lines and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and I apologize. I just want to jump in real quick. So shall for six months, Richard, are, is, is, is that cool for staff? I understand the need to make it six months. Do we want to say not to exceed six months or do we want to say no matter what the TUP shall be issued in increments of six months, i.e. potentially reserve staff the right to say, hey, we're going to do three months or four months, et cetera. But once again, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. I think that that makes sense, uh, Pat, to give us the option in case something does happen. I mean, I don't anticipate it. Uh, I don't, I, I personally don't believe that 300 spaces is really going to be an issue. Um, I, I think we'll be able to, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can make this easy on the applicant and, and do one. So that's, that's, that's okay confused. with you, John. Well, I'm a little confused. Yeah. Uh, are we saying Six months, uh, are saying six months and expires upon expiration of the uh, use of the lot. Or are we saying shall be determined by Richard or shall be six months unless, in other words, you got to have, Just, when you so get a CUP, you have to state the, how long it lasts. Restate it, Patrick. And so, yeah, it, it would basically just be staff would have the ability to issue one for up to six months, but would not be required to do so, okay. i.e., 
so they could say, hey, we're, we're, we're going to do three months this time. And so just, yeah. Can we say six months or longer? <laughs> no, it would be not to exceed six months. Not to exceed six months. Six months. Yeah, but my question is, why do that when they can change it? They can cut it off anytime they want to. Hey, once again, I'm, I was just, in, in hearing your language, I just heard staff shall issue TUPs for six months. That struck me as, as a bit rigid. If that is the direction of, of the commission, I'm not going to be then, one. Then I'd like to make it can issue TUBs for Perfect. six months. Okay. Uh, and then, and I mean, for, I'd like to make it a year because they can always change it. Then we don't have all this paperwork. Does anybody object to a year? Yeah, I, I'm perfectly happy with what Patrick uh, suggested. Okay, so that's my motion. All right, is there a second to the motion? I'll yes, second. Craig, is that your hand up, Craig? Yeah, I'll second. All right, is there further discussion? Let's call the roll, Kathleen. Commissioner Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Vice Chair Weil? Yes. Chair Jennings? Yes. Motion carried. All right, that concludes um, whatever that was. We're now on item 5F. 5F is Coastal Development Permit 18-013. This is 6361 Sea Star Drive. Can we get a staff report, please? Certainly. Um, before we get started with this item, I just want to make a side note that uh, I am the point of contact for the ADU ordinance, um, the special meeting on Thursday. So if anybody, um, public or uh, commissioners or otherwise, uh, has any questions or wants to talk about the ordinance or walk through it, um, I'm happy to have a phone conversation uh, with anybody who wants one. My extension is 301. Thank you, Justine. You're welcome. Um, so to get this started, uh, good evening, Chair Jennings and members of the Planning Commission. The project before you this evening is CDP uh, number 18013 for a new single family home and associated development on a vacant lot at 6361 Sea Star Drive. This project was last before the commission on November 4th, 2019 and has been redesigned slightly based on feedback from uh, the Northern neighbor um, or, or a neighbor uh, and the planning commissioners at the time. Um, and I'll be discussing the redesign in more detail in a minute. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the subject proper property is an irregularly shaped non beachfront vacant flag lot, as you can see here. Next slide, please. The site, uh, is accessed from Sea Star Drive by a driveway um, extending from Sea Star Drive. And what you can see in this image here is the driveway, which already exists, uh, required by the Los Angeles County Flood Control District access easement. Um, and that takes up the entire flagpole portion of the, of the property. The large drainage easement in the southeast corner is developed with a drainage and debris basin um, with a surrounding fence that is managed by the LA County Flood Control District. From the drainage easement, the property slopes up steeply uh, from south to north for uh, about 15 to 30 feet before leveling out. Uh, and you can see here the excavated area and a related pile of excavated material to the left. Um, that's from a previous approval um, and I will discuss that later on as well. Next slide, please. Um, the project as currently designed proposes a new 8,164 uh, square foot, uh, eight feet, 18 foot tall single family residence with an attached uh, second unit above the garage, a pool and spa uh, with this concrete pool deck and patios, uh, an impermeable driveway and non-exempt grading as well as a new OWTS <coughs> and landscaping. Um, a variance for encroachment into ESHA and constructions, construction on slopes between three to one and two and a half to one, um, or sorry, that's a, that's a site plan review are also requested. Next slide, please. As originally proposed and now, 
in general, the proposed project, like I said, includes a pool and a pool deck facing to the west um, with the driveway and motor core roughly following the western and northern boundaries of the subject property. A second unit is located above the proposed one and two car garages and the proposed basement includes internal access from um, uh, the, the recreation room up to the first floor and two points of external egress. At no point does the structure exceed 18 feet. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> Uh, as I mentioned before, on November 4th, 2019, the subject application was continued um, to a date uncertain to allow the applicant to redesign the project. The applicant has um, made the following modifications. Uh, they reduced the maximum height of the structure by lowering the height of the garage, the second unit, and the motor court by two feet. They reduced the overall square footage of the residence um, and relocated square footage from the area previously within the rear yard setback to the west side of the house um, and the second unit uh, in order to withdraw the request for the minor modification, um, which had previously been requested for a 20% reduction of the rear yard setback. There is no request for that minor modification at this point. Um, and lastly, a kitchen was added to the previously proposed guest house. So that's now uh, listed as a second unit. These changes also resulted in the addition of eight cubic yards of non-exempt grading and other minor changes to the design, like the overall square footage of the pool. Next slide, please. Uh, to illustrate the, the bulk of the changes, here you can see uh, an overlay of the first floor of the original design, which is in red. Um, and under the plan of, and, and the plan of the new design, which is shown in black. The area shown in yellow or shaded in yellow uh, was removed, that square footage was removed, and the area shown in purple is the square footage that was newly enclosed. Next slide, please. Um, to recap the history of the lot a little bit, uh, a single family residence was previously approved on the subject property by the city in 1994, which also included um, a minor modification to reduce the rear yard setback. Um, and in 1997, the California Coastal Commission issued a CDP for a new 28 foot high, uh, 6,116 square foot single family residence with a basement. Um, and that also included uh, the fuel modification uh, up to 200 feet from the main residence as this one does. Um, excavation for the approved residence and preparation of the approved driveway occurred between 2000 and 2002 before the project was abandoned. Um, and we saw the, the evidence of that in the Google image previously. The proposed residence is designed to take advantage of the excavation, which has already taken place, and to avoid encroaching onto variant slopes uh, south of the proposed location. Next slide, please. Um, here you can see some, some site photos and story polls of the redesign uh, from almost by Sea Star uh, Drive from the on-site drainage area um, on the left from the existing driveway um, at the top of the slope. Um, and there you can see the excavated material on the right. Next slide, please. Um, on the left, you can see uh, back from the neighbor's lot, um, which is at a lower elevation than where they would be standing on their rear lawn. Uh, you can see that photo on the left. And then on the right is a photograph looking towards the ocean uh, from on the subject property. Um, and again, you can see that excavated area. Next slide, please. The LCP ESHA and Marine Resources Map and Biological Assessment um, does not identify any ESHA on the subject property. However, ESHA is mapped on the adjacent property uh, to the north. A biological inventory completed uh, by and BICOM in March 2018, so pre-fire, uh, concluded that based on the field survey, um, the City of Malibu's ESHA overlay map did correctly illustrate ESHA habitat, which is located approximately 43 feet from the rear property line and 94 feet from the edge of the residence at its closest points. 
And you can see those illustrated here in this image. Uh, therefore, 205 feet of fuel modification would extend into the ESHA and the 100 foot required ESHA buffer. Next slide, please. Uh, here you can see the 10,000 square foot development area uh, illustrated in blue. Due to the easements uh, located on the southern part of the subject property, as well as the size, uh, steep slopes, and shape of the property, there's really no feasible alternative location uh, that could support resi residential development and avoid encroachments into the ESHA for fuel modification. Therefore, the allowable development area is limited, as I said, to 10,000 square feet, um, and a variance is requested for encroachment into the California Coastal Sage Scrub ESHA. Um, in addition, the project is conditioned to provide mitigation for unavoidable impacts to ESHA and for the removal, conversion, or modification of natural habitat for new development, including the required fuel modification. Next slide, please. Uh, a site plan has also been requested due to the development proposed on slopes between three to one and two and a half to one. Uh, you can see that circled here in black. Um, and there's two circles, a little bit hard to read. I'm sorry about that. Um, although the proposed development is sited on the flattest portion of the lot uh, and in the same building pad area as the previously approved development, a small portion of the nook facing the south falls over the steep slope. Um, and it is not feasible for the driveway to be designed in a way that would maintain the width required by the LA County Fire Department and avoid disturbing slopes requiring either an SPR located to the east um, or slopes which would require variance located to the west. Um, and with that, next slide please. Uh, in conclusion, staff recommends the adoption of resolution number 21-43, which approves CDP 1813, uh, including variance 1939 and site plan review 19091. Um, I'm available for questions as well as the owner. Thank you very much, Justine. Um, disclosures, please, um, Dennis? Uh, none. David. Yes, uh, visited the site, walked around there and spoke to the owner and the architect, uh, but nothing that isn't in the report. John? I talked to Justine today and went, went over the uh, ESHA setback. Uh, everything's in the staff report. <clears throat> Craig? Um, I visited in 2019. I re-watched the public hearing from November 4th, 2019 and uh, noted that there was discussion at the time of an intent coming out of that meeting of lowering the overall height by three to five feet. And there was some discussion of some kind of firewall, the possibility of doing something on the property there. I don't know if that's seriously considered, but that's something that might be worth talking about tonight. Um, I've had uh, multiple involvement with the property dating back to the late eighties when the Sea Star development was in, in development or in consideration by the county. Um, if there was a permit issued by the city council in 94, I probably, I was on the city council then, so I must have been participated in that, uh, uh, in that granting of that permit. But I have not, um, I have not approached it since, uh, since it's been in front of us this last two times. Um, Okay, uh, who said, um, I'm sorry, Kathleen, who do we have as speakers? We have the applicant team of Douglas Burge and the owner representative, Gregory uh, Bega. Uh, all right, who's going to speak? Is Doug or, or? I believe Douglas Burge will be starting. Okay, uh, are there any other speakers uh, signed yes. up? No, just the two. Okay, can you open up Doug's microphone? Uh, good evening, commissioners. Can you hear me? We can hear you, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Burge. You have 15 minutes. Uh, you can use all of it or any portion of it. You can save some for rebuttal, although we have no other speakers signed up. So you're, you're good to go. All right, I just wanted to start off by saying thank you for hearing this project again. It's been over a year since we first brought it to the commission. Um, we've spent some time working with the city staff on 
primarily the issues that were brought up both at the hearing um, from listening to neighbors and also uh, the staff issues concerning with ESHA and the setbacks. We immediately knew we would be redesigning the project, even though we were against the ESHA, we had felt originally that was uh, not gonna be an issue with the minor modification request, but then it since became an issue. And so we had no problem uh, changing our footprint. Um, also over the past year, um, the um, owner of this property, which is Greg Gregory Vega representing the ownership, um, he's gonna be speaking just in a second <laughs> against the efforts that they've been making with the neighbor. And there was um, unbeknownst to what was discussed tonight, um, uh, prior to the uh, owners buying the property, actually the property line for this uh, particular property was encroaching into the neighbor and vice versa. So they were able to work out a mutual easement that's now recorded and worked out. So the um, our rear of our property and the, I guess you could say the front of their property facing uh, the ocean view is now been resolved as a non-issue. And we had also, we had other meetings with them and they had other meetings. And so we had agreed that uh, we would go and while we were changing the house, let's go ahead and, and try to lower it. And we ended up going that route. Um, you know, we could, we could, you know, we'd study going a lot lower um, but it just was not feasible. We had already uh, removed some uh, grading situations. We have the road and the driveway that was already there. We didn't want to do unnecessary grading on landform alterations. And so we felt the two feet, because again, we already are restricted to the 18 foot envelope by right. And we felt that uh, giving in and producing something in the most area where the uh, neighbor's view would be impacted. So we felt two feet and we story pulled it and that was something that was uh, mutually agreed upon. Um, I know there's a letter that was just recently sent in today. Um, apparently, they're asking some other questions on that. But Mr. Bega will be able to speak on behalf of his negotiations. We were not involved in those negotiations um, with the neighbor. Um, also wanted to bring up that, you know, this has been a project that, uh, you know, we're very you know, love the design and we feel like it's compatible being 18 feet, the way it's broken up. Um, the previous uh, approval, which was for a 28 foot high house, obviously it was 10 foot higher, or actually 12 foot higher than what was actually being proposed today. So uh, the neighborhood is then uh, becoming with our own codes, um, you know, sympathetic now with the heights. And we feel that the house fits into the hill. Um, we are using the existing roadway to minimize the grading, keep the driveway where it was. We felt that was a great spot. Um, and so we really do feel within this period of time, it's been a long period of time, uh, the project before you is is uh, been sympathetic to all of the new rules or actually the existing rules been in place for a while, not the, the new rules. And between the ESHA uh, working um, out a, a situation with the neighbors, so then they are able to work out some mutual agreement on a on a um, uh, something that Mr. Vega will be able to talk about, and we look forward to hearing your comments. And we're available for comments also. So thank you very much for hearing us. Okay, we've got eleven minutes and twenty four seconds left. Um, who is your other speaker? Um, I think it's uh, Mr. Vega if he's available. Um, okay. Maybe he's signed up or not. Yeah, I'm here. Uh -oh. Okay, Greg. Okay, Mr. Vega, you're on. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you for uh, hearing us tonight. Uh, I think Doug covered pretty much everything uh, that was in question. Uh, there were a few other issues on the letter that the neighbor sent. We are, um, you know, we're communicating. We have a, you know, good relationship with our neighbor. Uh, and as Doug mentioned, we did everything we could to address their concerns. Uh, lowering the house two feet. Uh, and then if you look at the story poles, that is now below their, their line where their sight line. Uh, so we were able to do that, which was great. Um, and the other, uh, there are other questions. Uh, he had a question regarding the retaining wall, um, <clears throat> you know, the erosion control plan. Well, um, we have Justin Holt, who is, you know, GeoWorks, and basically he said, that the neighbor can refer to sheet four of the grading plan set that is an erosion control plan. Therefore, a plan is in place. And also note that having an erosion control plan is a city of Malibu requirement, and the city inspector will be enforcing proper erosion control throughout construction. In addition, the developer has to sign a certification 
that he is directly responsible for implementing erosion control measures throughout the construction. So that addresses uh, his erosion control uh, question. Uh, and his, his last one was the ESHA variance. Uh, and obviously that is no longer an issue uh, since we are not asking for a ESHA variance at this point. So I think we, um, we answered uh, his questions. Um, and again, we, we're working with him, we're communicating with him, we have good relationship and we will continue working with, uh, with our neighbor um, throughout the whole process. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Vega. Um, is there, you have nine minutes and 24 seconds left if you wish to preserve any time, but if there are no other speakers, we'll close the public hearing. Kathleen, are there any other speakers? No, there are not. All right, then we'll close the public hearing at this point and we'll bring it back to the commission table for discussion, John. Uh, <clears throat> this is for Justine. Uh, Mr. Vega just said there's no ESHA variance. Uh, aren't we asked to pass an ESHA variance tonight? That's correct. Uh, there, there is a uh, variance request for encroachment into ESHA. Uh, I think maybe he was referring to or got mixed up with the minor modification uh, for um, uh, to reduce the rear yard setback, which had you know further um, added to the encroachment into ESHA, um, has been removed. And so um, I think that was part of the conversation last time, and that is no longer a part of the conversation this time. Okay. But yes, there uh, is a variance for ESHA. Is I, as I understand, this property was burned during the fire in 2018. Um, is, has there been any consideration of any kind of fire protection wall or anything uh, since this is a major canyon where the, the fire came roaring down? Or is it just open land? Is this a question for Mr. Bega or Doug uh, uh, Burge or who? It's, it was for Justine, but um, okay. anybody can answer it. <clears throat> They never proposed that to me, but they can probably speak to if they considered that. Okay, uh, maybe Doug could tell us. Doug, can you uh, can you open up Doug Burgess' mic? Thank you. Doug? I got it. Yeah, I, I don't. That's the first time I've ever heard of a fire wall. Mm -hmm. I, I, those of you that have had your houses burned down and, and the, the, up in that neighborhood, uh, a, a wall is not going to stop a fire of this magnitude. Um, so I'd like to know a little clarification on what is meant by that. Um, we, as you know, have many, many rebuild projects going on, and I've never heard of a firewall, uh, nor do I know its function or of its possibility of even doing what anybody's intending it to do. So, no, we, this is not part of this project, but I'd be interested to know a little bit more about what that means. Well, in the past, in some houses we've required that are particularly susceptible when they have a, a, a variance from the distance from ESHA, and clearance that they put up a wall, usually about six feet tall along the border to basically stop embers and uh, try to stop the fire. Uh, it's been done before. I just wondered if anything, you have any protection at all along the, uh, what's basically a fire channel to the ocean. Uh, there's nothing planned, John, and again, um, we all know that something like that doesn't stop embers and it, it wouldn't stop. I, again, I don't, maybe you can reference an example of where that might exist and did it perform to what everyone wanted it to perform to, but in all of our experience, uh, that would not be something that would be uh, anywhere deterring the type of fires that we're talking about. I, I, I remember what Commissioner Maz was talking about. It was a meeting and it was a, on a project in Point Dune, and it was a wall is on the lower part of the property, uh, Mr. Bird. So um, it was one of those larger houses, and I think the people had some problems with their neighbors and whatnot, but I do remember that wall going in down at the bottom of the of the property along some Esha or a creek. Another, another data point on that, that one of the big burnouts in Woolsey was out in Oak Park where there was a golf course, and because of the smooth character of it, the embers developed into what was called a laminar flow and were just flowing along at ground level over a long distance. So 
to me, it seems like it might be helpful to, and, and by the way, this was talked about in the 2019 hearing. I just watched it. I wasn't, I, I think it was Chris and somebody else. Anyway, if you had a three or four foot solid wall on the bottom of rock or concrete, stone, something, and then the, the remaining two feet might be something more view permeable and uh, wildlife permeable, um, even that three or four feet along the bottom would help catch any of that kind of laminar flow kind of stuff given that the hillside above there seems like it might be susceptible to the golf course effect i yeah pardon the pun about a slippery slope but i don't know how we can start down this road and just sort of willy-nilly say we want firewalls on these kind of houses in this area and maybe not those houses yeah. in those areas i mean I, if we're going to do that we better be consistent about it and have a, 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 a sort of specific requirements that would enable us to say we need that kind of wall on this kind of property I and mean, all of malibu is a fire area well, the way yeah. down that slope is to say that they're wanting a variance for the esha intrusion here so that might be a way right. to say, fine do that but put the wall in yeah, yeah. That was, i mean that's that, that is my intent my intent was just to let mr burge know that i remember that coming up in a meeting I don't particularly prescribe to do that, but it came up in a meeting and, and it's something that was done. That's all. Okay. Second question, Justine, does this have the standard uh, fencing requirements that are, allow uh, allow wildlife? The, uh, the, uh, the wildlife permeable fencing? Wildlife permeable fencing. Um, I will need to double check the resolution. Uh, okay. While you, while you get a chance, uh, I have a question to Jeff, and that is, when the, when this development was made, <clears throat> there was quite a bit of controversy about the trail. Yeah. And it apparently never went in. Um, can you well, enlighten us? Of, it, there was an easement allotted uh, or, or a, a trail right that was really not very practical that run around the other the, the, the bottom edge of the of the development uh and it was never developed as far as i know okay yes the um wildlife fencing uh standard condition is added as condition 20. thank you okay further guess uh, craig um yeah the, so the the, the Prior discussion was the last meeting was to lower it three to five feet. They've lowered it two feet here now. Um, I don't have any sense of whether that's a material difference or not. Is it? Is there a way to distinguish? Does that matter? And I'm I'm guessing there isn't a way to say that there's a, a big material difference between two and three feet. So then I guess the question would be, um, could we condition stuff that might be put on the roof as per the neighbor's request. And he, he said he didn't want to see a satellite dish. I, I, you, I don't think you can argue with a sat, a, you know, anybody can put that, but maybe to say that any large HVAC or uh, solar panels or something would not be put on the roof. Is that something we could put in to assuage Richard, height concern? Uh, the, 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 first of all, the, the structure is below 18 feet. And Richard, don't we have rules that say, uh, you know, like excluding chimneys and this and that and the other thing, there are limitations or some exceptions, but other other things can't be included in that. Help me out, Richard. Uh, sure, yes. So in general, um, to, to answer the commission's concerns here, at present, they don't show any rooftop equipment or anything above 18 feet. If in the future, somebody were to come in here with an air conditioner, um, I guess air conditioner is pretty much all I could think of. If they were going to put that on the roof because of the screening involved and the fact that it's something above 18 feet, it would trigger a, a need to do um, at least an APR or something where we do a site plan review attached to it and the neighbor would be noticed. Um, rooftop antennas and chimneys are typically exempt from our code. Um, solar panels, uh, Pat can jump in on this one, but under the Solar Rights Act, it, it we cannot regulate solar panels on a roof like that. So 
in general, the way this thing is approved, if they were to come in and do something new over 18 feet, because Justine, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm looking at the plans and that roof is pretty much at 18 feet. So if they were to do anything more, it would, it would trigger a public notice and a, a site plan review. But solar panels could go on the lower steep slope down below maybe? It's at a good angle there, I don't know. Well, that's yeah. a good choice. It's a question of whether the neighbor is concerned about anything obstructing his view on the roof and you're telling us, Richard, they can't do it. So, well, what I'm saying is that if they were to come in with something new, because that seems to be a concern of the neighbors, like an HVAC unit, that would trigger a public review or public notification and a review process. A rooftop antenna would not. And under the Solar Rights Act, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Pat, we really don't have the ability to dictate where somebody puts their solar panels. Um, Commissioner Hill brings up an interesting point because uh, yes, there, there are spots on the property, but I, I don't believe from speaking with our other city attorney today about this, that we really have the ability to dictate someone's placement of solar panels. Richard, uh, would putting a facility outside of the development area would, would violate the 10,000 square foot limit, wouldn't it? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's another issue. And solar rights is one of those things where uh, the the state really wants us to be accommodating, and so it, we we try to follow that rules as best we can. Another uh, deemed approved thing. Um, uh, the, the, uh, my last question: the, the neighbor had a complaint about adding a kitchen to the second unit. Is I I, that, I don't know that what that concern would be about. Um, I just thought I'd raise it because he raised it, but I don't I don't see. The problem with that does anybody else no yeah. well they've, they've changed it from you can't have one in a guest house so you just changed the name to another name Second unit yeah uh, i have one last question and that is is it is this house only 58 square feet less than the last house that is that so the number does. so then we the last them, proposed house not the original yeah, yeah. So we had asked them to reduce it, and they reduced the fifty-eight feet. Is that a we, fair I, I think we we I just watched the hearing. We asked them to lower the height some, and we asked to address the the ESHA buffer. Previously, they were within eighty-six feet of ESHA. This time, they're within about ninety-four feet. So they. Uh, I'm just reading the staff report on page one. It said we asked for a reduction in size. Uh, I don't know where that came from. Okay. <laughs> I'm done. All right. Questions. Uh, can I get a motion, David? Yes, I would move to adopt the staff report. I didn't. Uh, are any of those amendments that you mentioned? I don't think so. Staff recommendation, you mean? Yes. Sorry. Uh, no, I don't think there have been any changes that uh, that have I, been discussed. Is there a second? I second. Further discussion? J uh, <laughs> Kathleen, can you call the roll, please? <laughs> Vice Chair Weil? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. <laughs> um, bear with Commissioner. me a moment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Maza? No. Chair Jennings? Yes. Motion carries. All right, motion to adjourn, please. Oh, can I ask, a, uh, just before we meet, I'll make that motion with a uh, recommendation to staff that before I make the motion that when you come back with all these wireless things, can you check the conditions that you, we don't really want in there so we don't have to take them out each time? I move we adjourn. Uh, I'll second it. Kathleen, call the roll, please. Commissioner Mazza? Yes. Chair Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Commissioner Smith? Oh, yes. <laughs> Vice Chair Weil? Yes, please. Motion carries. Good night, everyone. Night. Good night. Good night, guys and gals. Where are we going to do this? Here we go.